dear students of the BI International Business School, I'm honored to welcome you, as well as uh, faculty members, to the Gender Equality Conference. <laughs> welcome also to the uh, many students watching the broadcast on the, the BI uh, diverse campuses around the country. We will be joined on stage today by prominent Norwegian politicians, researchers, and business people. Today, as I'm sure you know, is the International Women's Day, which reminds us of the social and political value of gender equality. And together today, we will uncover the economic value of gender equality. This is, after all, a business school. And Norway has, after all, come far in female representation uh, in the workforce. So far that it, is, that it has become a driving force in our economy. But we haven't come so far that we can't listen to outside voices. So six international students from all over the world, they're seated here in front of me, uh, they have been carefully selected. Uh, they have visited BI uh, and Norwegian society throughout the week as a part of the first gender equality experience. Uh, they bring with them outside perspectives, learning uh, what we do well, uh, but also reflecting back what we can do better. May I also add that 30% of BI students are international, so it's only uh, natural that we have an international conference and that it is held in English. And to further ensure this uh, outside perspective, uh, we have invited someone uh, who has been at the forefront of history for decades uh, as an international pioneer for gender equality. None other than former Secretary of State, Senator and First Lady, Mrs. Hillary Clinton. She will be joining me for a Q&A uh, later uh, today, uh, and uh, she will also be answering questions uh, that we have received from uh, you students. So we're looking forward to that. Um, then I would like to uh, start it off uh, with, uh, we're going to have two welcomes. Uh, and uh, first off is Inge Jan Heyedsson. He is president of the, you all know him here, president of the BI Norwegian Business School. Please, Inge Jan. <laughs> Dear students and honored guests, this is a day I have been looking forward to with great excitement. We are delighted that you have chosen to join us here today to discuss different perspectives and challenges related to gender equality and the importance of diversity in society. As one of Europe's leading business schools with high ambitions, both nationally and internationally, we have an obligation to contribute to a better world. Our research and education are a big part of this contribution. It is equally important that we use our strong position to create arenas like this for constructive dialogue and for exchanging ideas. Therefore, we have invited eminent speakers from the business community, politicians, and our own faculty to shed light on gender equality from different perspectives. I'm sure it will be an inspirational day. This week, BI have invited international students from around the world to come to Oslo to participate in an exciting and challenging program, focusing on the theme of gender equality in Norway. The interest to participate has been overwhelmingly positive. Out of 785 applicants, six lucky students or participants sitting here in front have been selected. This week, they have talked with politicians, they have experienced gender equality at work, 
visited families with fathers on paternal leave, and much more. All in all, an exciting and educational week, in which they have gained new perspectives and faced challenging tasks related to gender equality, the economy, and to diversity. As an international higher education institution, we have an important role in contributing to the knowledge and dialogue on important issues. This is directly connected to BI's strategy, which has sustainability as one of our most important pillars. BI is an international business school with students and faculty from all around the globe. Going to Norway is not for everyone. First impressions of Norway and Oslo vary greatly depending on what time of year you arrive as a student for the first time. The quality of our academic efforts stay the same. Since the beginning in 1943, when our founder Finn Øyen himself delivered evening classes in business administration and accounting, we have come a long way. Today, we are considered one of Europe's largest and most recognized business schools with more than 20,000 students every year. We have triple accreditation, we have excellent merited faculty, and we have a global footprint. BI still lives according to Finn Oyen's philosophy, to bring the latest research to life in the classroom, to involve the business community to ensure relevance, to look beyond Norway's borders in order to stay ahead of the game, and to offer flexible education for people in all stages of life. In the immediate future, we will see rapid changes in business worldwide. Society will face new competency requirements. Companies will call for new knowledge, fresh insight, and employers with a unique set of skills in new fields. As a business school, an academic and educational institution, our most important responsibility is to impact knowledge development, pushing the research frontiers and sharing new knowledge with students and the public. To all the women and men out there, let us together celebrate the importance of the International Women's Day. I hope you will gain new knowledge and valuable insight throughout the day. And now, to open the program, it is a pleasure for me to welcome the Mayor of Oslo, European Green Capital 2019, Marianne Borgen, on stage. <laughs> Minister, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure I welcome you to Oslo, to BI Norwegian Business School and the Gender Equality Experience. It is also great to be just here to celebrate the International Women's Day. A special welcome to our international students. It is really an honor that you have chosen to study just here in Oslo. You have come to a city with great universities, a fascinating history, beautiful natural surroundings, with the fjord and the forests that are embracing the whole city. Welcome also to the European Green Capital for 2019. And today, on the 8th of March, a special welcome to all the women present. On the International Women's Day, it is particularly important both to celebrate and to work across borders for more fair distribution of power and resources. And my friends, in order to achieve this, we must fight for gender equality against abuse and discrimination of women. <laughs> equal rights and equal participation have their own inherent, inherent value, but they also benefit the society as a whole. They are drivers of economic growth and development. Because economic independence is the basis 
for women's liberation. Women's participation in the labor force has contributed tremendously to Norway's growth and welfare. It has contributed more to our GDP than oil from the North Sea. This means it is important to make use of all human resources in our country, not just half of them. It is not only good for business, it is good for the whole society, and it is necessary in order to strengthen our democracies. So what did we do in order to stimulate women's entry into the labor market? How did this come about? In 1978, the Gender Equality Act passed in Norway. And for many years, Norway has been investing in family welfare programs, including an extensive three-part parental leave scheme, which is divided between father and mother, so that both now have 15 weeks of leave each, and in addition to, uh, to that, a joint period of 16 weeks. We have also worked to provide daycare for all children. So more than 90% of the Norwegian children at the age of one to five uh, are currently in daycare. Full coverage for children in this age range is now secured by law. So we have, and, we, and in addition to that, we also have established a right to paid leave when the child is ill. Due to these investments, Norway now has one of the world's highest rates of female participation in the labor force. So as you see, women policy and child and family policy are interconnected, linked together. However, challenges remain. Many women still work part-time. We also have a gender-segregated labor market that where women work in sectors with lower pay. They even get lower pay even if you have the same education and you, you are working in the same sector, so think about that. And the employment rate for female immigrants is lower than for non-immigrant population. And violence and abuse are still a serious problem all over the world, not, but also here in Norway. It happens in all walks of life, and we must work together more intensively to end all forms of violence towards women and also children. We have had a year in Norway where the Me Too movement has rolled up, sexual harassment. Women have had the courage to tell their stories about abuse of power in virtually all types of occupation and jobs. The Me Too movement gives hope when it comes to harassment of women. There have been discussions in, and changes, but I am afraid this will not last. And the pressure must be kept up. We must stand up for all women to end all forms of violence, abuse, harassment, discrimination, because these are all important elements in the liberation of women. Today on the 8th of March, it is important to me that we recognize we have come a long way and at the same time do not forget that we have more to go, we have more to do, and we do not have to forget today also our sisters in other parts of the world where the situation is quite different. In order to reach equal poss possibilities and to secure economic independence for all women, education is one of the most important things we can do. When Malala Yousaf Yous Yousafzai, when Malala Yousafzai, together with Kailash Satyarthi, received the Nobel Peace Prize back in 2014, Malala said in her Nobel speech, I quote her, my hope is that this will be the last time we must fight for education for girls. Let's solve this once and for all. We have already taken many steps. Now let's take a leap, quote, end of quote. So, Today, gender equality has become a central Norwegian value. But we must not take this for granted, because the battle have to ha has to continue. And I hope you will all join in the celebration of the Women's Day later on today at the Jungstorge this evening. I hope to see a lot of you there. Uh, and we have, because we have a job to do, 
to secure gender equality here in Norway and also around in the world with our sister solidarity and solidarity in general. And uh, we also must recognize that we can all be a part of the necessary change. You can do the change. We can do the change together. So once again, a warm welcome to Oslo and have a very interesting seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Marianne Borgen and Inge Jan Henjesan. Now we are ready to start the conference, and we're going to start out with a bang because we're going to start with a very decisive statement. It is um, that women are more profitable than oil. And why is that? <laughs> Starting with a decisive statement and applause, that's a very good start. Uh, this is a quote uh, from um, uh, Hadia Tajik, the deputy leader of the Norwegian Labour Party. So um, it also answers the eternal question in Norway, what are we going to live of after the oil dries out? Dries out? <laughs> We're going to keep producing women workers. Please, Hadia Tajik. OK, guys. I'm going to make a very simple claim, and the claim has been introduced, that women are more profitable than oil. And I do mean this in the very literal sense of the word profitable. I mean it in, in dollars and euros, or kroner and euro, as we would say in Norwegian. Um, and I'm not being metaphorical at all. So basically, if you were to be um, a rich and crazy dictator, your main asset would be the women of your society. Please don't get me wrong, I'm not encouraging you to become crazy and rich dictators. I'm just saying that if you were that, the best asset would be the women, investing in them. Investing in women creates not only individual success stories, it creates riches and wealth and success for the society as a whole. And in order to understand that claim, you will have to join me going back in time to the 70s to a teeny tiny village on the west coast of Norway. It's called Björemsbygd. It's where I'm from, as you probably gathered. I was born and raised in Björemsbygd by Pakistani parents from a working class background. I'm a Muslim. And I claim that you don't very often hear that kind of story, that um, a young woman in her 30s uh, having that kind of background ends up becoming one of the youngest ministers in the government of that country. Now, I've thought about this many times. I could have lived the same life, uh, worked just as hard, um, done all my homework, getting up in the early mornings, getting to bed in the late evenings, doing my very best, but not reaching the same kinds of heights that have been possible for me in Norway if um, all the other things were the same. Minority background, gender, working class background. And I do believe that is true for a lot of the female fe leading figures in Norway, be it in public or private sector, or be it in politics. You've all heard the old African proverb, you need a village to raise a child, right? You've heard it? Yeah. But actually, you, know, you need a whole society in order to create individual success. Now, if you'd ask uh, the average Norwegian, why is it that Norway is one of the richest of the rich countries of the world? Most Norwegians, and, and please do the exercise, just go out on the street afterwards and ask an, an average Norwegian, how did that, that become uh, a fact? Uh, most Norwegians would say that the thing is, in the late 60s, early 70s, we found oil on the continental shelf of Norway, and we managed those assets quite well, uh, creating the Norwegian state pension fund or oil fund, and, and basically that is how we got rich. However, that's not entirely true. The main reason 
why, Norwegian, why Norway is such a wealthy country, are the women in our society. Now, there are no genetic predispositions that make Norwegian women more profitable than other women, obviously, so it has to be something else. It has to do with the three Ws, work, welfare, and a well-organized labor market, which leads us to the fourth W, the profitable women. I'll start with a well-organized labor market. That's been of great support for my family as well. I mean, my parents coming from Pakistan to Norway in the 1970s, not knowing the language, not knowing the cul culture, not having any friends here, they were quite vulnerable to exploitation and mistreatment in the labor market. And again, I've thought about this many times. What if they hadn't come to Norway? What if they'd gone to a Middle Eastern country as labor migrants? What would have happened? We know that in, um, in some Middle Eastern countries, if you come there as a labor migrant, they take your passport from you. You've got nowhere to run. You risk not getting a proper wage. Most likely, you will not get a proper wage. And the contract that you end up signing on will seem like a slave contract. Now, this didn't happen to my family. In Norway, we have strong labor unions. And what the labor unions do is that they make sure that the laborers are not being exploited. And a very important part of that is also making sure that it, that, that is something they find equally important, regardless of what kind of background you have, what kind of country you come from. Because if the labor unions decide that it doesn't really matter, I mean, they're immigrants, they're somebody else's problem, not our problem. If they end up thinking that, they will create a parallel black market in Norway, which in turn will decrease the wages and the working conditions of Norwegians in general. So it's a no-go. That leads us to the second W, welfare. The way we tell our stories of success, we have a tendency to glorify pain. We love the story of the underdog, getting back at society, getting back at everybody who didn't believe in him, hanging on to his dream by his fingernails and then climbing to the top. But the thing is, safety is really important to people. And sometimes some people make it sound like having a safety net will pacify you, that it will make you lazy or unproductive or unwilling to take a risk. But a lot of experience and a lot of research shows us the exact opposite. The UN has several times uh, said that Norway is one of the best countries to live in. The World Bank Group has an annual publication called Ease of Doing Business, and it ranks Norway quite highly. Save the Children has said that Norway is one of the best countries for mothers. There are no rankings for best country for fathers. I don't know why that is. <laughs> but if there was such a ranking, I'm quite sure we would do well in that ranking as well. This is, of course, no coincidence. There is an obvious connection between being a good society to live in for men and women and being a good society to do business in, to prosper in, to be creative in, to take risks in. And this just underlines the value of welfare, of things like childcare facilities that you can afford, parental leave. We know that when women don't work, there are different reasons for that. They could be very individual. They could be social. They could be cultural. They could be religious. But it could also be about the basic economics of the family. Um, if the father is the one with the highest wages, it will cost the family too much if he's the one staying at home, unless you have proper maternity and paternity leave and kindergarten facilities that you can afford. Unless you have that, it's not going to be possible for most mothers 
to go to work. In Norway, as the Honourable Mayor mentioned, today we have 59 weeks of parental leave for each child. And more than seeing this as an expense for society, we need to see it as an investment for the future and future wealth. Because obviously, a good family life, a stable family life, it allows for more people, especially women, to take part in the workforce. That leads us to the third W, work. Now, this is the really easy one. I mean, if half of your population is not going to work, then you're losing out on half of the money you could have made. You're losing out on half of the talent that you have in your country. And in Norway, we've done the maths on this. If Norwegian women were working as little as the OECD average, Norway would be losing out on values equaling the oil fund. That's 8,000 billion Norwegian kroner. That's 1,000 billion US dollars. So women are more profitable than oil. And how is that for a crazy dictator strategy? Getting your women liberated. Getting them out there working, using their talents, making their way in life. The only thing is, if you do choose this strategy as a crazy dictator, investing in work, welfare, and well-organized labor mar markets, you risk not being a crazy dictator for very long. Um, even a Muslim woman in her 30s, from a village, with Pakistani parents and a working class background, might end up a politician on your level. Thank you. Thank you, Hadja Tajik. Um, in Norway, gender equality is also uh, equal on both sides of, of politics. Uh, let's not forget that uh, the four party leaders in the current government are all women. And uh, that the prime minister, the foreign minister, and the finance minister are women. In fact, the minister of trade and industry was, the last one, was a woman. So it's about time we let a man have a chance, huh? So here to talk about why gender equality is good for business is Mr. Torbjörn Rø Isaksen. Thank you. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was walking in uh, the Viglands Park in Oslo. Uh, it was together with uh, two friends. Uh, it was the middle of the day. We all had our paternal leave. Uh, and we were walking with our strollers or with our kids' strollers. And all of a sudden, a group of about 40 or 50, I think, what I found was Chinese tourists stopped us. Uh, and for a moment, I was very... Um, I was a bit conceited, actually, because I thought, I have been interviewed in Chinese media. That's true, so they might recognize me. Um, <laughs> as a minister, perhaps. I don't know. Maybe they've seen some brochure about Norway. But of course, it was the, the, the utter exoticness of three men walking in the middle of the day with their strollers in Norway. They didn't even know that one of them was a minister. And actually, the two others was my vice minister, and the third one had just become a member of the Nobel Committee. <laughs> they didn't care. And I'm sure there's a political message in here somewhere, but I just wanted to say this, because if there are any Chinese students here, you might recognize me from tourist photos. <laughs> Uh, two days ago, I was opening the Xi Conference, a big conference in Oslo. It's an important conference that brings together business professionals from across sectors and borders. And the goal is to increase diversity and, moreover, to close the gender gap in business. 
there's a lot of talk these days, and there have been, has been for a lot, several years about gender equality, and that's a very good thing because we need to talk about it as well. But of course, talking isn't enough, and that's the point of my speech today because we also need action. And when I say phrases like, we need action, I, I, I find myself thinking, we need action, that sounds a lot like a slogan. And in a way, it is a slogan. And my second point today is that we tend to have too many slogans and not enough systematic work when it comes to gender equality. We need more knowledge about how to do it. We need more knowledge and more systematic approach to the way we do it. We need an evidence-based approach. We need to regularly monitor and measure progress. We need to update our knowledge on a regular basis so we can see what's going on. We need to monitor results in individual companies. I guess most of you are business students. If you go into a company that wants to conquer a new market, and you have a CEO looking at that market saying, I feel like we should conquer that market, just leaving it at that. Would that be a good CEO? Obviously not. It would be a horrible strategy. What would you do? What would be the business way of approaching this? First, you would have a systematic approach. You would measure results. You would have a regular standard for gathering facts to monitor how the progress is being made. So why shouldn't we use the same business standard for achieving new markets, for example, when it comes to getting more women into private business? How come we let CEOs get away with just saying, I feel like this is a big priority, but without working systematically, without taking a systematic approach to how you can actually get more women at the top of business, either as board members, board le leaders, presidents, or in the management. I don't want to be pessimistic because there is a lot to be optimistic about. There's a lot to celebrate. However, gender equality and the bigger issue of diversity has to be and tends to be a big issue in all countries, including Norway. And there's a reason for it, even in Norway. Being one of the most gender equal countries in the world, we see it in our education system, we see it in our labor market, and not least, we see it in our private businesses. It's not about a lack of understanding, because everybody knows this is a problem. It's about deep cultural and business culture related issues. Let me just give you one example of why even though we can be optimistic and things are moving ahead, there are still some reasons to be, not pessimistic, but to be more impatient than we are. Many of you know this, but Norway was one of the first countries to introduce a quota for women on company boards. It was actually introduced under a conservative government, so there's a bit of a difference between conservatives in different countries, of course. The rule means that in accordance with Norwegian law, the boards of public limited companies must consist of at least 40% of either gender. And of course, in business, that means women in practice. So since the time of introduction, the number of women has increased on these company boards. However, if you look more closely, you'll see that the number of women on company boards has increased only in the companies where it's mandated by law. 12 years after the introduction of the boardroom quota, it's had no significant effect on women in boards in other areas or women in management in general. So if you look at the top of the power hierarchy in Norwegian business life, there is still a huge gap between men and women. Female representation is very poor. So why should, as a minister for trade and industry, or as a person in business, why should you be concerned about this? Well, the first reason, of course, is that it's about fairness. It's about justice. It's about equal opportunity. But it's also about long-term sustainable business. There is a lot of research that shows a positive correlation between a company's diversity, including the number of women in senior management, and its financial results. So that's one reason to embrace diversity. 
Diversity helps to provide a different and often useful perspective on various issues that are valuable to a company. Diversity also helps to solve challenges and see new opportunities, and as a result will contribute to improving the bottom line. So if you want to do something with diversity, it has to be a firm commitment from the head of the company, the leaders, the management, but also from the board. Because a lot of this has to do with company culture. Let me just emphasize the point further. Are there any reasons why a business shouldn't be interested in gender equality? Look at the world we're living in. In all countries, in the West and, in Mo uh, and around the world, outside the Western world as well, you'll see that girls are doing better in school on average than boys are. We're seeing girls and women breaking in to areas of higher education that used to be male bastions. 30 years ago in Norway, the cliche would be a male doctor and a female nurse. Today, a long time ago, several years ago, the majority of the people studying medicine in Norway are women. You see the same when it comes to law. You see it more and more in finance and business studies, and it will also happen in technology studies. So if you're in business, why in the world would you want a company that only recruits from half the talent pool? Why in the world would you want a company like that? Why would you not be concerned about long-term competitiveness? And what is long-term competitiveness about? It's about finding the right people. It's about finding the best people. And how can you do that if you only look in practice, not in theory, but in practice, only look at half the eligible workforce? Switch the perspective. Ask the crucial question. Why would you, as a young, well-educated woman, woman with good grades, just graduating, looking for a career. Why in the world would you want to start in a company where there is no obvious way, no obvious career path for you as a woman to reach to the top if you wanted to? The answer is, most women wouldn't. And to be frank, fewer and fewer men will sir, uh, look for that kind of company or want to work in that kind of company. So one of the things I stress as a minister for trade and industry is that it's not just about fairness, and it's not just about equal opportunity, even those, though those are utterly important. It's about business opportunities. I have a daughter, uh, Carla. She's four years old. She was, and I have a son as well. He's two years old. He was the one in the Chinese pictures. Uh, now and then I read her uh, bedtime stories. And there's a great book called Good Night Stories for Rebellious Girls. Uh, I, I, being a conservative, I tend to leave out the rebellious part, but it's really good. So it's not about princesses or dragons or superheroes. It's about real stories, about real women from all over the world, extraordinary women with courage and determination, astronauts, engineers, architects, painters, researchers, judges, politicians. And why, why do I read her, uh, read her stories like that, true stories, before she goes to sleep? Well, one of the main reasons is that it's the way I want her to see the world. She's four now, everything is easy for her in a way, but one day she'll grow up and she'll start to notice that there is a certain pattern in things. There might be a certain pattern as to what people assume she's interested in because she's a girl, not a boy. There might be a pattern as to what sort of depiction there is of women in uh, the public sphere compared to men. She's free to do whatever she wants when she grows up. If she wants to make, when she's 18 or 19 or before that, a very gender traditional choice, she can do that. But I want her to have a real choice. I want her to have not a real, not just theoretical, but real, actual choice. And if she wants to, if she can actually imagine herself to be a board member or the leader of a company or an astronaut or a physicist or a researcher or whatever it is, she has to have seen some women, 
some role models who have been there before her. If we're to succeed with attracting more women into private business, we need role models. Just give you one, let me just give you one more example. If you ask men and women in Norway, do you want to start a business? About the same amount, say yes. Doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, it's about the same amount between the genders. However, amongst entrepreneurs in Norway, 70% are men and only 30% are women. This is, of course, about a lot of things. It's about how we arrange our schools, our education, our taxing system, our system for helping entrepreneurs forward. But it's also about having role models and having a business culture that is inviting to women. We have to ensure that the most important instruments that we have enhance more women participation, not just in the workforce, but in the male bastions of private business. To have a real choice, you need role models. You need to have people who have been there before, who can mentor, who can teach you about what to do and what to do. And in order to have role models, we need more women at the top of the Norwegian business societies. So for me, ladies and gentlemen, this is about politics. It's about business. It's about competitiveness, not just for individual companies, but for us as a country. It's about how we use our human talent pool. But as a father, as a husband, and as a man, it's also personal. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to Torbjörn Rø Isaksen as well. And this concludes the, uh, the first political uh, part of the, uh, of the day, let me put it that way. We also have another politician later on, as you know. Uh, now we were gonna um, um, enter into what we call the sort of the scientific part, the academic part of the conference. And as you will quickly hear, um, we will uh, the scientists have picked up on the signals from the politicians. We're going to hear about quotas. We're going to hear about cultural drivers. And uh, first, we're going to hear about both uh, oil and uh, gender equality, because uh, we have a researcher uh, that has studied these very things for many years. And, and she's not only a researcher, she is the provost of the uh, BI, and she's also uh, a professor here. Uh, Hilde Björnan uh, will be speaking of Feminism in the 1970s, Foundations of the Norwegian Oil Wealth. Welcome. Thank you. So, uh, to those of you who heard me before, to those of you who are my students, to hear me talk about feminism is maybe a little bit surprising. Because typically I would tell you that we have oil, we found oil, and we are one of the richest countries in the world, and I'm going to tell you how we became so rich. And I'm going to do that now as well, but I'm going to add another story to it. And the story is about the feminism. And the reason why I want to talk about feminism is because that is actually crucial for our success. And partially it relates to what Hadia was talking about, but it's a different perspective on it. Because the idea here is that without the feminism, without the women entering into the labor force, we wouldn't have had the wealth we have from the oil. We would have been much more similar to countries which are suffering something you learn in economics, which is called resource curse. And it's all about luck, and maybe it's a little bit about politics, and maybe it's a little bit about hard work and the Norwegian way of thinking about things. But without the feminism in the 70s, which was exactly when we discovered oil, this would have not happened. The wealth wouldn't have been here. We wouldn't have 8,000 million Norwegian kroner in the oil fund without the feminism, I'm pretty sure. So let me take you through a little story. Let me take you to the why, what happened in 1969. And it starts with oil. So, uh, if I was going to give you a talk about uh, Norway and uh, the resources, I would start in 1969 when we discovered oil. We discovered oil in the North Sea, 
Uh, and since then, the oil sector has grown, and it has also been one of the key drivers of growth in the Norwegian economy. That is a fact. Uh, it has also crowded in many other industries. It has crowded in services and business partners. And for that reason, it has become a very successful way of uh, developing engineers, of service, business people, so that we could develop the economy. Uh, the key to the success is technology, knowledge, hardware, spillovers, and a really brilliant uh, polit political dis de decision in the 70s, namely to say that everybody who operates in the North Sea has to be a Norwegian company. Why was that brilliant? The brilliant was because by doing that, which, by the way, is illegal today, now we have to have free competition, but in the 70s, we didn't have to have that. By doing that, we developed our own workforce who knew technology, who knew who could develop to be engineers, and who knew how to operate uh, platforms and service industry. That distinguished us from many, many other oil nations who flew in engineers from the US who had expertise and who just took uh, the knowledge with them, and then some dictators, some others, got the oil wealth and spent it as they would. And that's why in economics, uh, developing resources in the way we have done it has been a key success. And if you see that figure up there, it shows metaphorically that uh, out there in the sea there is uh, oil and there's a platform, and that oil is extracted through complicated techniques and extracted into knowledge and extracted into wealth. And for that reason, Norway is one of the richest countries today. Throughout the 70s and 80s, we developed from being one of the poorest countries in Europe to one of the richest countries in Europe. And that is not just compared to Spain and other countries which are having a little bit of different economic structure than us. That's also compared to Sweden. That's the Sweden. And it's compared to New Zealand and UK, who are comparable research-rich countries. So why did we succeed so, uh, so well? As I said, the key was that we developed our own skills and knowledge, and we could use that. That is crucial, and we showed in research paper that that's why we were successful relative to many other countries. But something else happened in the 70s. Something else happened in Norway, uh, which didn't happen in Kuwait, it didn't happen in Venezuela, didn't happen in countries where they also discovered oil. We encouraged women to work. In the 70s, we went from having 40% of the labor for women in the labor force to today around 70%. The share of women increased from 40% to 75-ish percent. That is approximately, uh, if I remember right, how many people were living in Norway and in that uh, cohort, that is approximately at least around half a million, 400,000 women entering into the labor force. At the same time, men are flat. They're already there. But women went from a low number to a high number. And that was partly luck, partly politics, and partly what I call feminism. Because feminism was great at that time, in the sense that that was a way to encourage women to work, encourage women to take part in society, and by politicians doing all the right thing at the same time, namely uh, allowing women and men to have paternity leave, developing kindergarten, so putting all the right tools there, women could then enter the labor force. So this is part of the story. That's the part of having the resources entering into uh, this uh, economic situation and not just spending it all. So that's uh, the part of it which is brilliant. Uh, first time I thought about this was when I was in Kuwait two years ago. I was in Kuwait to talk about the oil fund, the sovereign wealth fund, the success of Norway, the fact that we had saved so much that we have oil money for future and future generation. And there were, as you would think, mostly men there. There were two or three women. And I was talking about Norway, about uh, the models, about uh, uh, the engineers and the business, etc., uh, and the sovereign wealth fund. And then one of the women asked me a question. She said, how come so many women in Norway are working? And I was looking at her, and typically I'm very focused on what I'm talking about economics. So I said, well, that's because uh, we have all the right measure in place. People, women can stay at home with kids, etc." And I just went on talking. And the men were sort of like hushing her a bit off. And then the other woman in the room, she 
raised her hand. Could you elaborate a little bit more <laughs> about why so many women are working in Norway? And then one of the men said, that's not important. <laughs> Actually, th at that moment, I realized I should no longer talk about the Soren Weltfund here. I should not talk about the engineers. I should talk about the fact that by allowing women to work, not only are you getting all the potential out of the workforce, as Hadia is talking about, but you are also allowing the country to grow. And you're also allowing the resources you have there under the sea to be extracted and to be developed into something good for the society, namely growth and, and, and uh, jobs. And that is what we are talking about in economics all the time. But they didn't hear it and they needed someone to hear it. So I talked for that for the rest of my speak. I just put, let aside everything about the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Who cares about the Sovereign Wealth Fund? You have all these people who work. And they were very happy afterwards. Not all the men, but never mind. <laughs> so so that's, that's, uh, that's, that's an important part to, to remember. And sometimes in Norway we take that for granted, but there at that time I didn't take that for granted anymore. So that's why I'm happy to be talking here about exactly feminism. Still, I have to say a little bit uh, about where we are heading off. Because although we have done a lot of right things, and although we are an exemplary country in how to preserve the wealth of the, of the oil, we have some challenges, and it has been addressed partly already. Namely the fact that we, don't, we have quite a um, segregated labor market in the sense that most women work in the public sector, most men work in the private sector. That's a fact, and the numbers are up there. And the numbers are for 2017. And I looked back at 2007, and I looked back at uh, around 2000, and the numbers are exactly the same. In fact, in the private sector, female share in the private sector has gone down tiny, slightly a bit. So it's, it's like we have succeeded to get women, women to work, but we haven't succeeded in getting men and women to work with equal share in the public and the private sector. And I think that is an important, uh, I think that is an important uh, thing for politicians to focus on now, not just focus on all uh, the thing which we had done so well already, but the focus to get female and men to work in both in, in the private and the public sector. And one of the reasons for that is that because if, uh, if we think where the labor market is going, we need interaction between the public and the private sector, and we need interaction between female and men in the different jobs, because we are going from a very resource-based uh, uh, environment to mo uh, an environment where we, where we need knowledge, technology and business. We need that together and we need uh, women and men to be developing skills and to take skills further into new energy and to data science where they need uh, to be able to, to, to have the job opportunities uh, in the same way. And we know that the workforce, we know that the labor market is going to change going forward. We know that there's going to be some skills we need more. We need more uh, people working in the health sector. We need more people working in uh, with uh, maybe with computers and data analytics. But we don't want to be all women in one sector and all men in another sector. So I'm exaggerated because it's not that bad, but I want to emphasize that we need that to be a focus. And one of the reasons I think we need that to be our focus is because I think still, although we have succeeded in many ways in Norway, still there are discrimination against women in a way which is much more difficult to, to, to see today. There are what I call informal discrimination, there are attitudes, uh, and I know it from being a professor in economics for many years, and I saw it in Kuwait, and I see it still in Norway, that there are attitudes against women, and these attitudes are in, in particular uh, problematic in the labor mar or in, in, in jobs where there are a majority of men relative to women, because then it can grow. I'm sure there are attitudes against men also, uh, and uh, we don't want that either, but uh, typically the one we talk about, uh, and there has been some study in economics uh, and in also in uh, organizational behavior, where they see that in academia even there are attitudes which makes it harder for women to succeed than for men. So I want that to be a focus, and particularly for the young generation here. Um, when, uh, when I work with students like you, uh, and I have also an eight-year-old daughter, I know that you have high ambitions. You have really high ambition how we want to succeed. It, as, as it was said, all of you want to succeed, all you want to develop and succeed in some way or another. But you want to do a lot of other things as well. 
You want to be on the social media. You want to have a perfect outfit. You want to have a house. You want to be successful. You want to have many friends. You want to go hiking, etc., etc. I have one word to, you, to say to you if you want to succeed. Prioritize. Prioritize, and the older you get, prioritize even more. Don't stop prioritize. Because if you don't prioritize, you will not succeed in what maybe I should be focusing on here, namely get a great education and get a great job. And uh, by prioritizing, you have to say no to something, to say yes to something. That's really prioritizing. So going forward, I want you to prioritize. I remember that even further. That's what we did in Norway. We decided to prioritize that we want to develop oil. We decided that we wanted to prioritize our women entering the labor force. And that was a success. In that way, we prioritized away something else. We didn't do Volvo. We didn't do Silicon Valley. Maybe that's stupid for us now, but going forward, we can do that. But with my last slide for you to, with regard to prioritize, one thing I prioritized is never waste my time in the house. <laughs> okay? Thank you, uh, Hilde Bjørnland. And now we're going to look into the, the cultural uh, drivers uh, behind this. And I, I started out uh, this morning. Uh, it's, it's a busy day being a, a man in the gender equal uh, Norway uh, by leading uh, the Women's Day um, breakfast at the Kulturhuset, the cultural house today. And, and I had to dress up like this uh, because I was coming here later. Uh, and I was uh, leading a debate, which today uh, called uh, women the uh, weaker sex. So it was a daunting task standing there on stage. And fortunately, there was a guy uh, in, in, the, in the, the audience that was uh, wearing a knitted sweater and had a baby with him, probably on paternity leave. And the baby caused a lot of uh, uh, a noise. So fortunately, uh, the focus was also on him, and not just this guy in the suit telling them that they were the weaker sex. Uh, in fact, it was, a, it was a good discussion, and it, and it, was, a, it was a provoking, obviously, in, intended uh, discussion. It was the Norwegian uh, uh, Women's uh, Public Health Association, Solentetskvinne, that invited. So there's a lot of debates going on uh, all through the day, uh, not only the economic value uh, of, uh, of um, um, gender equality, but obviously the, the, the political and social uh, as well. So it's an inter it's interesting thing all, all throughout uh, the day and all over Norway. So, uh, coming back to the uh, cultural drivers of this, we are fortunate to have uh, with us uh, today Gillian Warner Söderholm. Uh, she is Associate Professor here at the BEI, at the Department of Communication and uh, Culture. Uh, she's also a Brit, as you will hear soon, and she uh, has researched uh, us, or, or the, the Norseman culture, as she says, drivers of gender equality in a Norseman culture. Please. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a huge pleasure to be with you. By the way, you might be wondering if I um, have a, a back problem. Can you see that little lump there? Interesting enough, here we have uh, Women's Day, and the mic systems that we have um, globally are for men that wear belts. So women, we don't wear belts, so we have to like, would you mind if we put this in your underwear? <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge honor to meet our uh, honorable guests, uh, ministers, amazing international students, and our great students um, that are here with us every day. I have a message in 10 minutes' time for our students, and it's this blank piece of paper. Um, and I'll tell you what the message is. This is a metaphor in 10 minutes' time. Before we start, could you please just raise your hands if you believe that you identify as having brown eyes? Brown eyes. Have a little look around there. Brown eyes. Hazel is good too. Good. Thank you. Would we say that even though our colleagues here with brown eyes are probably people that have unique skills in terms of collaboration, in terms of being very um, well prepared for meetings, people that are looking for solutions in an organization and that drive team leadership, would we say that it's 
okay that those people might never make it to the very first stage of a recruitment process? Are we saying that it's okay that those people will make up the most 22% of artificial intelligence future job opportunities? And perhaps up to 69% of these people will be working part-time for much of their lives. And if we're lucky, 28% will become mayors. Is that okay? If not, we have to look at drivers for change, which is us. The symbol on my first slide, those of us that are, I feel a little bit Norwegian when we win all those gold medals. <laughs> this is Marne Lundby, as we know, and I'd like Marne to be a symbol, a metaphor for us today, because this is a person who truly believed over a decade ago that women have the greatest opportunity as men of ski jumping. So she won a gold medal last week at the World Champions. It took 10 years. Was it only Marne that believed that she could shape change? No. In all of our lives, we have actors, supporters, allies pushing for change. So that when we're looking at the drivers of gender equality within a Norseman, a Viking, a Norwegian culture, we're looking at not only Marne having cultural values that shape change, but all of her supporters. And for us in our lives, globally, we will have perhaps some people invisibly, perhaps some are politicians, uh, local legislators, family members, networks that are part of our lives, pushing for change. So here we can see that Marne is someone who believed in change, but a huge network of allies and actors pushing. And that is the case with all changes and developments. Norway is today number two in terms of the country with the least gender gap globally. So we've come so far, we're 85% there. But did you realize that it's gonna take us 61 years, according to World Economic Forum, 61 years to get there? And how can we get there is not only individuals trying to shape change, it is everyone being allies. So this conceptual model is built on a number of research. You know, we love to have citations at the bottom, so you can have the slides afterwards. Um, here on the left-hand side, we can see the key drivers for cultural change. Let's take a look at those. I'd also like to add that on the right-hand side, our dependent variable is the idea of gender equality in the workforce. And in the middle, of course, we have a lot of institutional factors that uh, many of my colleagues today have already talked about. If we consider a society that believes in power distance, that would be a society that endorses clear levels of power with the elite, authoritative people in the society. If we consider gender egalitarian values, we're looking at societies where we consider the never-ending problem of equality where your biological makeup does not defend who you are in your career. Some questions that are used by the World Economic Forum to judge this with millions of responses are, and please consider your answers, in your society, would you say that men make better politicians than women? In your society, do you believe that a university place is more important for a man or a woman? And the third question is, in your society, is it more important for a man to be a manager or a female? So culturally, this makes sense within a Nordic context because we have responded to those questions in global surveys and we have proven that we do not accept uh, an elite class structure where power and authority lies at the top. We do not accept a society where um, your biological makeup defines whether you get to have a fair career and take part in a global and national business. 
Secular societies is another key factor, that if we are in a country where there are secular values, meaning that religion might be part of our lives culturally, we might truly value having um, our own faith, but it doesn't define who we are. So our religion is not a barrier. We do not have, in a secular society, clear role models for men and women. We believe that uh, balance is the most important element. Um, achievement and managing uncertainty. Culturally, in many societies, we believe that we should manage uncertainty by having high transparency, by having low corruption and anti-corruption measures. We believe that uh, managing through having an institutional setting where 90% of children, for example, under five are in childcare, and most 70% uh, of men take paternal leave, which is mandatory. So all of these elements institutionally give us a chance for both members of a family to drive a career. Interestingly enough, in Europe, a great degree of drivers for change culturally um, are media, because media, together with civic engagement, shows that we are all involved, we are all wanting to be actors pushing for change. So if we look at the key elements on the left-hand side, of course, through the middle, we can see, as Hilda mentioned, the idea of economic education uh, attainment is critically important. Um, and if we consider how maternity and paternity leave match our cultural drivers, well, because we believe in a non-segregated society and because we believe in equality, our maternity leave pushes forward the mandatory paternity leave. And paternity leave has the biggest explanatory factor for career ladder um, opportunities, so that men will jump off the career ladder to take paternity leave, giving women the chance to jump back onto the um, career ladder. And that has a knock-on effect. So you guys are our second generation of families that are used to seeing both parents actively take part, and that um, is a, a precursor to gender egalitarianism. So the secret of success for our Norseman model, as I've mentioned, based absolutely on a strong institutional setting, welfare and the fabric of our society, which we've realized that we need, with only 5.2 million people, we need everybody in work, uh, that we do have expectations of gender equality, that we expect a work-life balance of both parties. And at the same time at work, with low power distance, autonomy is greatly valued. The idea of being given a task in a project team and driving through with it. Trust, we talked about trust in police, trust in uh, legislation, trust in anti-corruption measures brings us to a chance for uh, gaining greater drive for change. And our tough-mindedness, the idea of speaking up and pushing for reforms. Consensus is part of our mindset within a Scandinavian focus. And luckily, we can see that praise face and diplomacy are less important. What does that mean? It means that we have managers that are a coach, a mentor, very low hierarchy. Open doors means innovation and stronger opportunities for both genders. So a lower importance of status, titles, and incentives. This fuels innovation, and then we're starving inequality of oxygen. Well, to conclude, two messages. We've now looked at what are the drivers culturally, and if we are going to say that oil is the new wealth in Norway, it's slightly problematic for me, because why wouldn't they be worth the same price per barrel? It's my big question. So if I'm worth 78 kroner an hour and my colleague is worth 100, is that fair? I would add in the UK, the in parity is greater. $30,000 is a, a usual salary in the UK for women, $55,000 for men. So we're closing the parity gap. But still, 
Shouldn't women be worth the same? And is actually not the new generation of men and women, our new oil, working together and driving gender equality values? And so, my last message to you all, this piece of paper, to our amazing leaders of the future. You stand on the shoulders of giants. You stand on the shoulders of activists that have worked for 150 years to have health reforms, to have voting rights, to have democratic opportunities, and to create the best education. So this piece of paper is a symbol of your future on our behalf, my generation as a mum. Have an amazing career. Be actors pushing for change. Don't screw it up. <laughs> Thank you to Gillian Warner Söderholm. And, uh, and now we've already uh, heard a hint of it because uh, the, uh, the Minister of Trade and Industry talked a little bit about quotas and he also explained that uh, he was frustrated by them. They didn't work exactly as they were presumed to, to be working. So we have a researcher here at the BI that has been uh, researching this very subject. Uh, Morten Huse, he's a professor at the Department of Communication and Culture. And, and he's looked into the fact that, uh, well, yes, uh, in, in many ways, the gender quotas uh, have started to work, but that's not uh, due to the law uh, only in itself. There has to be have a lot of different factors in place. So here to talk about um, how gender quotas snowballed into an avalanche is Morten Huse. I was wondering if I should stumble in here, being the one of the men coming here. Thank you for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be here with you as students coming from other countries, from our students, from faculty, and all the listeners <coughs> to the presentations. This Norwegian snowball, the quota, has received a lot of attention. Seeing here on this first picture some of the presentations on the main Italian newspaper celebrating the paradise for women in Norway. But it's also been criticized from many sources. The second one is from Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, where it's presenting some of the problems being around the, the golden skirts coming in. I'm planning to follow up some of the presentations we had here before. I'm possibly going into a micro level, but I'm trying to take it into the other countries. What's been happening? Other places? How have other countries been looking to Norway? And actually, I came last night, I was, actually this morning, I came back from, from Spain after having my 8th of March speech in Spain last night, or that was middle of the day yesterday. Uh, so people are listening. And uh, I will, our business schools making research. Definitely, we're doing research. And I'm also wanting to show that much of the research we're doing is really hands-on and practical, in addition to really lean on the core theoretical backgrounds that is important. And I'm taking you into a kind of a programmatic research area, trying to understand gender equality and how Norway, how countries around the world has been looking to Norway to learn from Norway. So, this is based on not only one study, but a large number of studies over three decades. And uh, if we're following some of the previous presentations, we've been focusing on the objective is to try to get gender balance or a sustainable society. It's not, first of all, to get business work better, but to create a long-term sustainable society. That's what we've heard about in several of the previous presentations here now. We've been hearing about differences in cultures and norms and how that is different, how Norway may be different from other places. We've been learning about different instruments, public policies instruments to be doing something about it. The focus on this programmatic area is trying to put these different things together, 
trying to understand this kind of ecosystem of understanding, this avalanche. And when talking about an avalanche, we're seeing the snowball starting rolling. But the avalanche may be positive, but very often it's also negative. It may include so many things that we didn't think about, so many unintended consequences. And that's among the things I think we should think about when also addressing this today. I'm focusing not only on women per se. I'll try to take it a bit broader and narrower. But first, which are the lessons from Norway? <laughs> which is the starting point? If you think back in the 1990s, where strong feminist movements already in Norway, but the number of women on boards in Norway, just four or five percent in the listed companies. Despite strong women networks, this strong, despite strong attention from media and the press, despite research telling how important it is for business to have a diversity and to have more women in business. Despite for BI and other, well, not BI at that time, but it's, it started coming seminars for women to learn the, the rules of the game in business. And even more, started to make business training for women, similar to MBA trainings, to get women also on a business background. In Norway, this was a main topic throughout the whole 1990s. We got mentorship programs. We got programs, or we got lists of women that were all seeing themselves as highly fit for board memberships. Several thousand women were on the list orchestrated by the director of equality in Norway. But we're seeing the situation. Nothing really happened. Not, nothing really happened, even though a law was announced. We had two different law hearings, but still nothing happened. Until one day it was, well, it was not only by chance, because it was a strong focus from uh, several governments, both and the social democratic government and also the more conservative governments really wanted to do something, to do something for women, and then they were trying to find alternatives to get more women on board and suggested a quota regulation. But as the law was announced, with requirement of gender balance, there was no choice anymore. And more or less countries from all over the world has been coming to Norway to learn about what we have been achieving, wanting to see something similar as what we've been seeing in Norway. But then you see the avalanche also coming. <laughs> what is really happening? Well, we need to understand that these different instruments is not rooted in the same kind of understanding, the same kind of dialogue. There have been different reasons for different types of instruments and we need to know which are the intentions behind them. I will return to that in um, a few minutes. There are tremendous differences across countries, and I, I've been fortunate to be able to follow these kind of differences across a large number of countries over decades. And there are differences with respect to the kind of laws being, being there. Different types of law systems, different feminist debates, they vary. And there are different assumptions about women in management. And there have been different main advocates trying to do something. I'm not going through this model in detail, therefore I've been taking away the countries, even though we can find the countries there. <laughs> and also some of the consequences on the women being board members or becoming board members in the different countries as a result of the pressure of getting a quota. <laughs> I'm not going to stop with that one. I would be happy to discuss in more detail, but you see how some of these differences are. I will focus on uh, two small illustrations, 
to show some other things behind. I'll take two countries. I'll show you something from Norway and, and Italy. In, in Norway, we had this discussion about the golden skirts. And the golden skirts were considered to be a small number of women that were replacing the old boys network. Yes, correct, they were replacing the old boys network, but they were different from the old boys network. Um, and it was not one group of women. And they didn't represent any particular group of elites. But we could easily see that some of the women being recruited were typically having an advisory contribution to the boards. Others had more controlling contributions. Some had more the, the, the decision-making contribution. And some had finally more the value-creating contributions. And I don't think they all contributed in the same kind of positive way to boards, even though in different ways. We have been following. This was some of the immediate things we did immediately after the quota regulations uh, appeared. But we've been trying to follow these golden skirts over several years and been finding there's been a movement. Movement from the advisors, controllers, and decision makers to the value creators. They didn't find it really attractive to them unless they were able to have a contribution in creating values in the company. And that's what we've been seeing now, even though the list of women that have multiple board memberships is not the same as it was some years ago. Then uh, a more recent study is Italy. I've been fortunate to be very hands-on in, in Italy for some years, and uh, seeing also how the law developed in, in Italy, and they got a quota regulation with 33% of the board members being women in Italy. But then it was possible to try to see which were the women being board members in the early phase as they were more or less looking to Norway. They had a kind of gentleman impression. They wanted to be positive. That was around 2010, 11, and then they got the law in 2011, 12. And then they had a kind of a pressure, but it was not that urgent because they had still some time until 2015 because the law had to be sanctioned. And then we were seeing that there were different types of women being recruited when they more or less died this kind of a normative or going into this, well, from the mimetic kind of pressure to the normative kind of pressure to the final coercive time of pressure, where they, they were seeing that the law was there and it would be sanctioned very soon. And, um, the Italian case, we were seeing that at first we called them the Berlusconi women. <laughs> I think you can identify that. In the second group, it was the elite women from Bocconi network <laughs> that were really positioning them and working hard to become board members and being a part of the group. And in the last phase before the law was sanctioned, they had to find new ways of getting the women. And they were searching in new ways through headhunters and different ways, and they found the, men, the women in business, representing very different things than what we're seeing in the beginning. OK, there were two small illustrations. And uh, then I will have some of my final things. Quotas are not enough. At least when we are wanting to to see what is happening in society. For gender equality in society and sustainability. What I've been learning in some of my studies, uh, even though it's been quite critical, I'm not always allowed to, to go into this kind of studies as trying to understand feminism. And in, uh, in my studies about feminism, then it's in the core trying to understand the different arguments and the different waves of feminism, from that of having voting rights, having equality, as the two first waves of feminism, and then the third waves of feminism, we have more or less this micro-focus, where some would say that we have the blue stockings, or those sets of seeing that women have all possibilities if you're wanting, and you have the freedom. And the fourth wave of feminism, then you're getting more back again to the second phase, but then you're integrating it with other groups that also have challenges and problems. We are having this kind of intersectionality that is coming again. But intersectionality 
then you want to see also the problems with handicaps or people with, with different types of other challenges, minorities, people from different backgrounds, and also for men. Are what we are doing also something that is positive for the men? Which is the role of men in this kind of discussion? I think we need to understand the talent pipeline. What is motivating us? And women have much more holes in their talent pipeline, in the pipeline through their careers than men. Women have holes that might be seen as negative, and their holes in the top that are seen as positive. Much more freedom, but also pressure to do certain things. Men do not have this kind of holes taking them out of the pipelines. And they do not really have the holes for doing other things. I'm thinking about Maslow. The reality in the world is more than just making money. The reality is more than just getting status and making a corporate career. Women have had the possibility to do alternatives, a possibility as breadwinner, men as breadwinners never have had. We need to think also about the role of women as breadwinners and also let the men have the possibility to do the things that women have been able to do for generations. If you're not doing that, women will still keep on with the traditional things. And men will still stick to the core line, direct line of being the one in charge of the home economy, doing the daily things. We need to have the similar possibilities for men and women. And in that way, childcare possibilities, paternal leaves are important. And uh, as one of my students, PhD students, was uh, describing, she was, told, she was in, a, in a fast track in, a, in Deutsche Bahn. Uh, but she was saying that I am, I am the academic housewife. She is following the career path. We should have, as men, the possibilities to make other choices than following the corporate career. And unless men are also skidding, getting this possibility, I don't think we'll really get gender equality. Thank you very much. Thank you to uh, Morten Huse. And this concludes the academic uh, part of the, uh, the conference. Um, we will now enter the, the business part of the conference. And let me just uh, uh, tell you now that uh, we will uh, we'll have three uh, speakers and then we will have a break, a fairly long break, 45 minutes, when we will prepare the room uh, for, the, for the last session, which will be the, uh, the Q&A. OK. So, um, We've now heard about you know, how, how the politicians lay the groundwork um, and, and how the, uh, our scientists believe that this, that this functions. Uh, now we're going to hear three business cases, uh, three different companies uh, that have their own uh, take on this, that uh, have decided within this framework um, to, do, um, to push it forward. Um, and, and as we started today with, because it, it's good for business, it makes money. Um, so um, our next talk will be uh, from um, uh, Tobias Beck, uh, who is a founder of Buck and Beck, and Iris Kuppen, who is a system thinker there. Um, they have uh, decided that promoting uh, the um, uh, work family is, is uh, connected to promoting uh, the um, workers' family. So here to talk about baby steps toward change diversity and inclusion at Bakken and Beck. Here are Tobias Beck and Irish Kuppen. Yes. Good. yes. Uh, just one small thing before we start. It is. Yeah. <laughs> what do you call a funny mountain? A what? A funny mountain. Hilarious. <laughs> Sorry, I promise not to do it. <laughs> I was forced to do this. <laughs> Don't blame me. 
<laughs> okay. okay, so my name is Tobias Beck. This is Iris Kippen. Yes. Um, does this work? Yes. It should work. Oh, no. Oh, it works. It does not work. Uh, so we're from <laughs> Buckingham Beck, uh, and today we're going to talk a little bit about our company and what we've done in terms of diversity and inclusion. So Buckingham Beck is a digital agency, uh, and we design and develop digital products for ourselves and our clients. Uh, we're around 60 people from all over the world, with offices in Bonn, Amsterdam, and Oslo. With several PhDs uh, in machine learning and artificial intelligence, we build everything from apps to robot journalists and crypto exchanges. For example, we built Kron, a smart and simple investment service. We also designed and built the latest version of VIPS, Norway's most popular payment app. And we work with Coinbase, one of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges in the world, to build new products for them uh, from scratch, uh, like Coinbase Wallet and Custody. Besides designing and building digital products, we have a soft spot for the serendipitous path of discovery. That's why we keep bees on our roof and produce our own honey, <clears throat> as a way to be outside and do something together in a different setting. And that's why we also host our own conference called An Interesting Day, as a way to learn and have fun together. We want to compete, uh, or we compete with some of the best companies in the world about talent. So in order to attract and retain the best team, we have spent a lot of time trying to figure out what really matters uh, for them and try to create the best possible working environment for our team. And that's why we a few years ago launched our handbook. It's online, it's accessible for everyone, and it gives a quick introduction to our culture, our work philosophy, and perks. The people we try to attract and retain are at an age where they have or are considering starting a family. So one of the things you can find in the handbook is the baby kit. The baby kit is a clear statement that we're a company where people can have a life, a family, and a career. We give all new parents a 2,000 euro bonus, free magazines and coffee, a restaurant gift card for you and your better half, and we also provide free paid leave across all offices, also in case of adoption. By designing the baby kit, we not only try to attract and retain talented people in a certain age, but we're also trying to change the way we perceive not only working mothers, but also stay-at-home fathers. We are here today to talk about gender equality, which is not only a women's issue. At our company, we believe that to create true equality, we shouldn't uh, ask of women to conform to the status quo, to lean in, for example, but we actually want to change the status quo. In other words, we don't want to change the behavior of women, but change the way their actions are perceived. The, the act of starting a family, for instance, Research shows us that men that are raising their children are perceived as being more resp res responsible, while women are perceived as being less committed to their job. By designing the baby kit, we try to override these biases. As a tech company, we make products that are used by many different people. I bet that most of the people here use apps like Vips, for instance. To, it's our job to understand the needs of a very wide range of users. To do so, everyone in our team needs to make an effort to shine a light on our blind spots, to see the way we perceive unconsciously the people that are using our products, but also the people that we work with on a daily basis and we build these products with our colleagues. We want to make diversity and inclusion everyone's business. That we define diversity in the most simple sense as people working together and also learning from each other's differences. But understanding our differences can be very hard because we are all made of, we have multiple and complex identities. We're not just men and women, but we have all these different traits that make us who we are. And lots of these traits are not visible. Diversity is often explained as an iceberg. So we differ from each other because of our characteristics. Some of these things are obvious, like our biological sex, or age, or race, but most of these things are actually underneath the surface, like our uh, value system of the way we think. 
and especially the traits that are under the surface are also developing and changing over time. We ask our uh, employees to be deep sea divers, to dive deep under the surface, to create a deeper understanding of each other. We want to create good products, and to do that, I think we should keep on broadening our perspectives. <laughs> we believe that fostering a working environment in, in which we embrace differences, not only in terms of gender, but in all the different traits that you so just saw on the iceberg, will make us more ready to react to the rapid changes in our industry. It will keep us ahead of the game, and it also will keep us sharp. But that's not the only thing. We also think that it will enable us to solve more complex problems. As designers and engineers, which we almost everybody in our company is, we like to solve very complex problems. And problem solving is rarely a very straightforward process. Every time you solve a problem, new problems start to arise. So by including different people and different experience from the beginning of a project, we will be more able to identify all the complexities of the problems we're trying to solve. Way early in the process, and also we are able to come up with more creative and innovative solutions to the problems we're trying to solve. For instance, our baby kit that we just described. When designing the baby kit, we thought we were solving a problem for a group of parents. And we based the idea of this group of parents and the definition of the problem of us being parents ourselves. And it was only after new people started to join our company that we figured out that the problem was not only about being a parent, but it could also be about becoming a parent. So we realized that when there is an us to be included in, there can also be a them who are not included. So by creating a space where different people can share their experiences and including different people into the conversation, so not only asking them to the party, but actually asking them to join the dance, we were able to create a baby kit that, not, that also supported people that considered adoption or needed time off for in vitro fertilizations. So we merged this them into a bigger us. At Bakken and Bebek, we want to create plenty of space for all our multiple identities and experiences. But at the same time, we also want to create an environment in which people feel like they belong to the company as a whole. We like to see ourselves as smaller parts in a bigger whole. People form the direction of our company and not the other way around. And to truly make that happen, we need to create an environment where people can be their entire selves and bring these entire selves to work every day. The conversation around diversity and inclusion usually happens on a moral high ground, but we like to start the conversation and speak about it in a language that everybody at the company can speak and understand. That's why we started to work on a guidebook, which is similar in structure as the handbook. The first part, the guidebook itself, is a collection of things to think about while working at our company, so day-to-day, -day, business, day, events. The other part is a glossary of terms, because like I said, we want to try to understand each other as best as possible. And the third one is a report with numbers that just show who we are right now, and also we can share our ideas on how we want to grow. It keeps us accountable. Anything to add? <laughs> it will be online soon. It will be online soon. Yeah. It's almost ready, or okay. ready for now, but it will be a work in progress, so we hope to keep on building this guidebook. Uh, we build things together as a group of people, and we believe that building an inclusive and diverse working space should be one of these things. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you to you too, uh, Tobias Beck and um, Iris Kuppen.
The, uh, moving on, the, uh, there are several companies that will not wait until laws are changed and, and see them work and not wait until attitudes are changed. So they're taking technology in their own hands. Um, and uh, it, artificial intelligence is one of the ways of, of actually creating a level playing field when it comes to gender equality. Uh, this is the mission uh, of um, Evry and uh, uh, Jeanette Durenne. She is head of emerging uh, tech there. And she's here to talk about robot recruiting for gender equality. Please. is my grandmother. And she once told me a story that I today will share with you because I remember this when I go to work. She was one of the first women after the Second World War who got her driver license. And she very happily drove around with her husband in the passenger seat and the kiddos in the back. However, she very rarely used her seatbelt. Not because she didn't want to, but back then, 100% of the people designing cars were men. So they designed the cars for themselves, here represented by my grandfather on the right. And as we know, men and women are physically different. Why does it matter, you think? Well, up until 2011, where a federal regulation changed the law and said that all automobile industries need to design and test their vehicles also for women, all the cars in the world were designed only for half the world population. That's pretty crazy. And you know what? The fact is that if you drove in a car produced before 2011, you as a woman has a 40% higher chance a critical injury or death compared to men. Why am I telling you this story? Because I work in a company that every single day, more than five million people, most of you here, use our services. And we need to reflect the society we are creating for. Simple as that. That means that we need to have balance in relation to cultural background, competence, age, and gender. How is it right now in the IT industry where I work? The status is that one quarter is female working in IT. Only one quarter. And it's even worse when you look at the leadership ratios. Only 17% within IT of leaders are women. And right now, studying, it's a bit better, but it's 28% female sitting there studying IT right now. So what as a company can we do? I'm going to tell you something that we've done, because as Hillary Clinton is coming on, she once said, we cannot do anything with the past we inherited, but we can do something with changing the future. So let me tell you about something we did, and it happened two years ago. So let's speed back in time, because time is of essence when you do digital transformation. So first of all, we started thinking about HR as a business and the people applying for that as the customers. And we started using strategic design thinking looking outside the box and see how can we solve this. 
And what we found out that if we could use robotics and AI, we came up with something that we today call cognitive recruiting. Do you want to know how it works? I don't know if anyone in this room actually applied to every right now, but on your right hand side, you have numbers that's completely fresh. This is from the current graduate program, and I think the deadline is like last week or something. Almost 1,600 applied. That's a lot. So they apply and say they're interested in working. Um, we usually, on average, hire 10% of that again on five different locations in the Nordics, two very different profiles, one IT background, one business, and everything else. And what happens is they apply, they receive an email that says, cool, we like that. Can you download this game, set off 45 minutes, and play it for us? It's not actually a game, it's a scientifically based test that evaluates people's skills and competences designed as a game. So within 45 minutes, we collect 12,000 data points, and then we match that to a better match within the roles in the company. Looking at your competence and skills, and seeing where you have the, your best fit to get your purpose. That's pretty cool. And not only that is it very uh, quick and fast and so forth, but since we started doing this, more than 5,500 people have run through this, we hire approximately 10%, but 92% of the people who apply say they're very happy with it because it's a fun uh, way to apply as well, and they feel they're encouraged. And that's one of the things that's most important for us when we design the new solutions. We have to think about the end users, and that's you. So, why is this important? For the past few years, every benchmark on the gender statistic has improved massively on the female-male ratio. And we see that we hired 800 people in last year, and out of that, 34% were women. That's much higher than what the basis is, and it's also much higher than what we see studying IT right now. What we see when we use new emerging technologies is that we get as high as 40%. That's very cool. And we're using it now because it's very important for us to reflect the society, as I said, that we're creating for. But recent studies from McKinsey, BCG, also shows that having a diverse workforce affects your top line, your growth, and your bottom line, because you get uh, more innovation, better discussions, and turn in the company as well. And that's something that's very fun to be part of in your everyday life. And we see that it's not only important for us, but we have quite a lot of customers, more than 10,000. And we see that when we also work together with the customers and we share the information and what they know and what we know, we get a butterfly effect. So we have customers like Norsk Genvinning or customers like Storebrand, who's advocates of the 50-50 that we now work together with to see how we can improve it. We just got a new CEO. Uh, he had his 100-day benchmark uh, a few days ago. And one of the first things he did in his new position, that was he said, we need to work on um, our female-male ratio. We need to have a diversity vision that within 10 years, and not over 60, like you said, we need to have 50-50. Within 2025, it needs to be 40-60. And this is not just a strategy, it's very systematically. We're going to use all the means necessary, and one of those means is AI and um, emerging tech. Um, but what we do see is that we, as one of the largest companies, IT companies in the Nordics, or the largest, if we don't do it now, uh, then, who will? And then if we don't do it now, then when? because we do this to shape the future so that when you apply, we're ready. Thank you.
Thank you to Jeanette Rønne. Now we have our last uh, speaker before, uh, before we take a break. And um, as you know, what, one of the uh, issues that we have pointed to that needs to improve is that uh, there, there's a, a lack of female business leaders in Norway, and the, the minister talked about it himself. Um, however, uh, we do have one business leader that uh, not only was uh, head of uh, um, uh, the NHO, the Norwegian Business Association, for six years, up until recently, but she now heads uh, Shipstead, CEO there, um, and uh, since she got on board, uh, they were today, in fact, um, uh, awarded uh, the, the top uh, on, on the SHE index. We had heard about the SHE conference earlier today by the minister. And so the SHE index uh, placed Shipstead at the very top um, when it comes to gender balance in leadership. And our next speaker, she, she uh, was quoted in the, in the paper saying that, how did you do this? Well, I restructured the leadership. So it's, it, it's, it's that easy, but also uh, that difficult. There's a method behind it, I'm sure. Uh, here to talk to us now is um, uh, Shipstead uh, CEO, uh, Kristin Skogenlund, on the topic, because it's worth it. Please. Thank you uh, so much, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all. And I have to say, I mean, there have been just so many brilliant speeches today that it's quite hard to be the last one, actually. Uh, but I figured that I would spend my 10 minutes telling you students and young people why it's really worth the effort to be ambitious, to take responsibility, and to make an impact beyond yourself. And I want to stress that despite that this is March 8th, I speak just as much to the men as I do to the women. So, as you said, I guess I'm one of very few, if maybe the only female leader of one of the large companies on the Oslo Stock Exchange. And I am so often asked about how I manage this difficult combination with the job and my family and my four kids. And I am so often asked about all the sacrifices that I must have made. But how come no one ever asks me about the incredible privilege it is to leave an innovative and purposeful company like Shipstead? And, you know, we own a, and operate uh, leading businesses and media like VG, like Oftenpost, and like Fin.no, and we do that in 22 countries. It's incredibly exciting. It's, it's absolutely amazing, and we help and do a purposeful thing. We help solve consumer problems every day. So I do not feel that I make any sacrifices. I mean, I have chosen this. I want this. I feel incredibly privileged. And I feel free. I am free to shape the corporate culture of a huge company. I'm free to initiate great innovation. I'm free to put together my own management team with the absolutely most brilliant people that I can think of and that I want to work with. And it did put us on top of the SHE index, which I thought was really cool. And how can I put this? I'm in a position where I'm kind of free not to take shit from anybody. <laughs> I can I can say no, and I can kind of choose away things that I do not have to be bothered by. And you know what? I get so much energy from my work. I love it. And I enjoy my colleagues, and I really thrive on the accomplishments that we achieve together. And in my previous job, when I was leading the NHO, I could have real political impact, as I represented the majority of Norwegian businesses in that role. I was listened to, I was always invited to things, and I could use this position to fight. I could fight for women's rights, for shared parental leave, for education, for inclusion of the underprivileged into the workforce, for climate solutions, for sound politics. I could fight for things that I really care about and that matters to society. 
And maybe most importantly, I could use my skills and that position to unite interests, those different interests within the NHO, but also the common interest of the unions and the employers to make a good and safe working environment. I could promote consensus and compromise in place of conflict. And I really, need, I really think our societies need much more of that. And I was actually in a position where I could do it. So, now, why do I say all this? It's, it's, is it you know, just to brag about all my great accomplishments? No, maybe a little bit, but no. <laughs> no, it isn't, really. It's because I want to tell you about the positive sides of power, career, and positions. I want you to be ambitious. I want you to strive for impact, to stretch yourselves and use the full range of your abilities to do great things. First of all, for our society and for the people around you, but thereby you will also, also do it for yourself, because that is the most fulfilling thing of all, is to mean something to others and to be able to make a difference. I was in London yesterday for Shipstead's Capital Markets Day. It's the one day a year where we meet hundreds of investors and financial analysts. It's a big day. It went well, and after our presentation, one of these more, more prominent asset managers came up to me and he said, you know, Shipstead is really great, and you have to be careful now that you dare to be ambitious enough on behalf of this company. And you have to make sure that your own fear, your own personal risk, does not get in the way of taking some big bets. And I'm very happy he told me that, because I think I need to hear it. And some years back, when I was first elected into the NHO as vice president, Eric's father, Finn Bergesen, who was then director, he took me aside one day and he said to me, I do hope you understand that the plans for you is that you shall become the first female NHO president. And I probably looked very, very shocked because I hadn't thought about myself like that. And then he looked at me again, a bit more <laughs> forcefully, and he said, but you know what, you have to really want it. And not only that, you need to show us that you want it. And I really needed to hear that back then. But for every one story like this, I think I've had 100 telling me to slow down, to take care of myself, to relax, and not to push myself so hard. And I'm thinking, maybe is this the best thing we can do going forward? Be a bit more like the asset manager in London or Eric's father. Be a bit better at pushing and nudging and encouraging each other to aim high. I have certainly needed to be believed in by others, and I have needed to be told that I could do it. It took many, many, many years for me to gain the confidence that you see in me now. Hopefully, you can shortcut some of that insecurity. So I'll try to end by giving you three pieces of advice for what you can try to shortcut it. We're all different, but you can try this. Ask yourself, what are the three most important things you really want to accomplish going forward? And then you have to make sure that you actually focus on doing those things and not all the other stuff that comes in the way and takes away your time and energy. And secondly, you should tell yourself at least once a day what you are really good at, because we are all really good at something. What is your specific advantage? And you should go out and you should do it. You should use it and you should do more of it. And that is so much more valuable than trying to correct any shortcomings that you might have. Don't ever let your own complexes come in the way of acknowledging your own brilliance. I wasted just so much energy when I was younger, trying to fit into a set image, fulfill some preset expectation that I thought was there. But you cannot merely fill a role 
and meet expectations because then you will actually not make a difference. You must not fill a role, you have to shape it. And in order to do that, you must actually break the boundaries of those expectations. You have to go outside the beaten track, take some risk, try something new, make suggestions, and question what's not, what does not seem right around you. And finally, my third advice to you is that as you go along doing this, you have to be really, really good to all the people around you. And let me stress all the people around you, not just the ones you think are important. Because if you succeed through others and you help others thrive, they will welcome your success and they will not envy it. And when the people around you will want you to succeed, that is actually the best recipe for succeeding. So good luck and thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Kirsten Skogenlund. Uh, this has been an uh, interesting, exciting, uh, thorough, and uh, in itself uh, a, a fantastic uh, conference uh, to be a part of. I hope you, you feel the same. Uh, it's not over, though, as we know. We have a treat for you. Um, but first, there's, uh, we're going to have a break. And not only that, there's going to be lunch. Um, and um, so just uh, pay attention now. Lunch will be served uh, between the A and the D block on the first floor. So between A and D block on the first floor. Um, uh, it's very important that you're back here until 2.45. Okay, everybody uh, made a note of that. You have to be in your seats by 2.45. We have some security concerns that we need to, uh, to take upon us. So, so uh, promise me that you're back 2.45 uh, here, because then the doors will uh, close as well. OK, uh, have a great lunch, and see you back then. Thank you.
I would again like to introduce Mr. Ingeon Henjestan, the president of the BI Norwegian Business School. Former U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton, BI students, students participating in the gender equality experience, honor guests, we are so proud to have you here. Welcome to all of you. As our, a top-ranked business school, our most important responsibility is to impact knowledge development, pushing the research frontiers and sharing new knowledge with our students and the society as a whole. This week is all about fulfilling this mission. In the first row, in front of me, we have six students from all around the world who have experienced gender equality the Norwegian way, part of a larger BI project called the Gender Equality Experience. Throughout this week, I know you have gained new insight and also challenged your way of thinking. I have been thoroughly briefed on your achievements, and I'm very proud of what you have done so far. So well done to you. Moving knowledge forward, breaking new ground, takes brilliant minds. The motion of knowledge is made up by thousands of small steps and the occasional leap. The value of role models with lifelong commitment Fighting knowledge and values in the right direction must never be underestimated. At BI, we occasionally honor role models and academics who inspire us. The conferral of the honorary doctoral degree is a tradition where we recognize people who have made profound impact to their field of work, lifting important questions onto the world stage. Today, we recognized former U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. Secretary Clinton has been a vocal advocate for women's rights, and, he has fought, and she has fought important battles throughout her significant, significant career. This effort corresponds directly with BI's strategy, aiming to shape people and business for a sustainable future. BI have made strong commitment to the UN Sustainability Development Goals, gender equality, quality education, and climate action. Secretary Clinton has used her influence in a number of important areas, as she strives for a society in which women have the power to affect change for development, justice, and for peace. Hillary Rodham Clinton has spent four decades in public service as an advocate, attorney, first lady, U.S. senator, U.S. secretary of state, and presidential candidate. As first lady of the United States from 1993 to 2001, Hillary Clinton championed health care for all Americans and led successful bipartisan efforts to improve the adoption and foster care systems, reduce teen pregnancy, and create the Children's Health Insurance Program. She traveled to more than 80 countries, standing up for human rights, democracy, and civil society. In 2000, Hillary Clinton made history as the first First Lady elected to, unite, to the United States Senate, and the first woman elected to statewide office in New York. As senator, she worked across party lines to expand economic opportunity and access to quality, affordable health care. In 2007, she began, be, began her historic campaign for president, winning 18 million votes and becoming the first woman to ever win a presidential primary or caucus state. In the 2008 general election, she campaigned for Barack Obama and Joe Biden. 
And in December, she was nominated by President-elect Obama to be Secretary of State. In 2016, Hillary Clinton made history again by becoming the first woman nominated for president by a major US political party. As the Democratic candidate for president, she campaigned on a vision of America that is stronger together and an agenda to make our e economy work for everyone, not just those at the top. On behalf of BI, it is an honor and joy to welcome Secretary Clinton to our academic community and to the BI family. Please welcome Hillary Rodham Clinton on stage to accept the diploma conferring her as BI and into different schools. And now, we are eager to listen to the remarks of the former, former US Secretary of State and BI's new honorary doctor, Hillary Rodham Clinton. The conversation will be led by Eric Bergesen. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I am greatly uh, delighted to be here and appreciate uh, the honorary degree uh, from uh, BI and look forward to our conversation uh, on this International Women's Day and especially because of the uh, Gender Equality Conference that has been uh, sponsored here. So um, let's get started. Excellent. Thank you and congratulations. Um, so on behalf of the, uh, the school, the students, uh, and the faculty, um, um, we're very honored to have you here. And I'm very happy to, uh, today to convey the questions of the students and, uh, and, and some of my own. And uh, <laughs> composites of your questions, OK? So uh, um, and previously, we had to get American politicians to come here. We had to give them Nobel Peace Prizes. So <laughs> we're, we're glad to have you here. Uh, and to talk uh, on this uh, substantive uh, matter, as you said, the, um, uh, this has been the theme of the whole week, and, and certainly of today, which is also uh, uh, Women's Day. And uh, we've, we've received a lot of questions from, from you students, and, and uh, some have to do with the, the social and political value, obviously, of gender equality, uh, but also a lot of them um, on the, the economic value of gender equality, uh, um, which uh, we've talked a lot about in the conference uh, today, and, and, uh, and most of the questions also deal with uh, today. So um, yeah, let's dive into it. Uh, the first question is, is, is easy, one would think, uh, but since it uh, deals with um, uh, gender equality and, and, uh, and uh, from learning from history, there are no easy questions and certainly no easy answers when it comes to this. Um, but here goes. Um, isn't the economic case uh, for gender equality so simple that any qualified business leader can understand it? You make more money from it. It, it's it's uh, you get to choose from the, the whole uh, talent pool and not ju not just half of it. And uh, we heard today earlier today about how that uh, uh, high representation of women in the workforce is just as important as, as the oil uh, to the Norwegian economy. What would you say to that? Well, I would agree with that. That's yeah. a great way of putting it. Um, I think the economic case is incredibly strong, but it is still either not believed adequately enough or ignored. And it is a case that is built now on decades of research about what grows uh, an economy and what are the steps that a government or a business can take 
uh, to increase GDP or increase profitability. Uh, very simply, uh, the evidence is overwhelming uh, that a higher uh, labor force participation rate by women uh, increases economic uh, output, increases the gross domestic product, that having women uh, in the economy, particularly at all levels of the economy, especially in decision-making roles, uh, leads to better decision-making that is, in turn, uh, more effective and catalyzing for further economic growth. And a lot of governments in the last decade have recognized this. Um, the most obvious, maybe well-known example is uh, the current government of Japan, uh, led by Prime Minister Abe, who, when he came into office, actually reached out to me and we talked about um, some of his ideas for stimulating what had been uh, a sluggish Japanese economy for quite some time. And in particular, trying to devise ways to uh, enable more women uh, to get into the Japanese workforce. And he understood, based again on international as well as national uh, economic analysis, uh, that that was one of the best ways Japan could proceed. Uh, and so he has been trying uh, to encourage businesses, uh, encourage greater um, social supports for women, so especially uh, when they have children, they ha can manage uh, both their family and their work responsibilities. That's just one example, but you could literally go across the globe and you could point out every economy that would increase if women's labor participation were not just um, encouraged, but expedited, enabled by governments. And, uh, the fact that Norway has over 72 percent uh, women labor participation is uh, one of your great economic uh, assets. Uh, in my own country, in the United States, women's labor participation has dropped. Uh, it's dropped now to, uh, you know, some, depending upon the survey, slightly over 60 percent. That 12 percent gap between Norway and the United States uh, is significant. It's significant for women's autonomy, for women's uh, own income and economic prospects, and it is uh, very important to the overall economic uh, outlook. So the evidence is there, and the real question is, why is it so hard? Why is it so difficult for businesses and governments to recognize uh, that they try all kinds of economic development tactics and overlook perhaps the most effective one right in their midst? Um, and maybe we can talk more about that because uh, if you go around the globe and you can see what increasing women's uh, labor force participation would mean to the overall economy, you know, obviously in some parts of the world, like the Middle East, uh, Africa, getting women out of the informal economy where they are working, but where their work is not being recognized and not being considered as part of the national economy, uh, to even the uh, so-called developed nations. Mm. And, and how do you explain uh, the fact you, you just stated that uh, um, a lot of people probably think that, well, it's at least going in the, in the right direction. It's, it's probably not going fast enough for many people, but, but there's actually a decline and, and, and in America. Um, I, I, and people maybe are, are, are leaning back and thinking that, well, history will take care of itself, but, but it doesn't seem to. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I mean, there, there was a, a steady uh, forward movement um, until relatively recently in the United States. In other countries, there has been forward movement, but then also backward. Um, so it's a, it's a constant uh, back and forth as opposed to a, a steady state. Um, you know, speaking for the United States, part of uh, our challenge is how difficult and expensive it is for individual families and certainly individual women uh, to uh, uh, find childcare that they can afford that is quality, uh, reliable uh, childcare, uh, the absence of paid leave in most uh, cases, although there's a uh, move to try to deal with that, not yet um, accomplished, uh, the um, implicit and explicit bias that still exists um, in lots of uh, sectors of the economy against women. Uh, and I think that in in other countries, you know, there may be deeper uh, bias, uh, more resistance. 
Uh, I've been following what Japan has done, and Prime Minister Abe has really encountered lots of resistance. Uh, the way the whole society functions, you know, the the the, uh, the typical uh, working family, particularly middle upper middle class in Japan. The husband works very long hours, including late into the night, because socializing after work hours is considered you know, part of the job, how you get attention that can then perhaps lead to um, salary increases and promotions. So women are primarily uh, the uh, caregivers uh, during uh, uh, most of the week. And the kind of uh, uh, services that are available require great maternal involvement. So, these traditions, these cultural uh, views about what is or isn't appropriate for women uh, are proving difficult, even for somebody in a government like uh, Prime Minister Abe, who knows that if he can just get more women in the labor force, uh, the Japanese economy would improve. Mm. Thank you. And there are challenges uh, left in Norwegian society as well. We've talked a lot about that already today. Um, um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the, um, so it's International Women's Day today, uh, but gender equality in the workplace is not only a women's issue, it's a family issue. And, um, and given that women do uh, three times as much uh, of t taking care of the kids and twice as much uh, housework, um, their equality at home uh, is important as well. And um, how, do we, how do we get men, how do we get the, the male students here when they start families to, to help advance uh, the careers of, of the women in their lives, and the wives and spouses? Well, I think, I think you um, suggested the answer in the beginning because you know, the idea of uh, gender equality, uh, women's economic opportunities, uh, is um, ultimately a family uh, economic challenge. And it is clear uh, that, um, again, going back to the United States, um, women are not yet paid equally. And yet, when they go to buy groceries at the store, they don't get to the catch register and have the attendants say, well, OK, you're a working woman, so you only have to pay 78 or 82 percent of what the cost is. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. But the fact is that the family economic unit would be strengthened uh, by women's uh, participation and by enabling women to be fully uh, involved in their uh, workplace uh, and have all of the same opportunities uh, that men would have for advancement and promotion. It's difficult because of the challenges of balancing uh, family and work. And I think a lot of couples make what is a, a realistic assessment early in their marriage life or their parenting life where they say, look, uh, you know, it's too expensive for us both to be working because then we have to pay more for childcare or we're not attentive enough to the children. So there's a uh, either explicit or implicit agreement that you know, the husband's or the man's, the partner's um, uh, career will take precedence. And that seems like a sensible decision early on. But as the years go by, it becomes uh, you know, quite uh, penalizing, because then women are not making uh, the incomes that they could have made that will, in later years, support uh, the family unit, support uh, the, the retirement years that uh, couples uh, uh, might have. Um, or if a woman is divorced or widowed, um, and doesn't have uh, a, and is not part of a couple, that she will have adequate resources as she uh, gets older. So a lot of those decisions really dep depend on what are the external supports in terms of childcare, leave, and the like, and what are the internal uh, discussions and decisions that couples make, uh, because if there can be a way to work out early on that uh, both people will be supported in advancing his and her career, economically that will benefit the family um, throughout the course of uh, their lives together. But it's a tough call. I mean, it really is. It's hard, it's hard when you've got you know, newborn baby, you've got toddlers, you've got school-age children, and they need you, and they need your attention. Uh, it's just you know, a, a very uh, difficult uh, decision to try to work out all the balance. And 
I think it is certainly fair to say that, again, going back to the United States, but by no means only the United States, uh, you know, men are, uh, and women are viewed differently in the workplace. And, you know, it still is quite unusual for men in the United States to ask for parent, you know, paternal leave of more than, you know, maybe 72 or 72 hours, a couple of days to get acquainted with uh, the newborn. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just something that people feel, men particularly feel, will penalize them. Uh, when I was a young lawyer many years ago, I, um, I, I remember reading an advice column. Okay, so I read advice columns all the time. Um, and this one uh, was a letter that was printed to uh, a man uh, who gave advice about the workplace. And the letter question was, I've just gotten a promotion, so I, for the first time, will have my own office space. And I don't know how to decorate it. I don't know what I should put in it. Seems like a kind of silly little question, but you know, this person knew that he or she, because it was only signed by initials, would be judged, as we all are, by everything. Um, so the answer was, I cannot tell from your initials whether you are a man or a woman. If you are a man, fill your office space with pictures of your family because it will convey to your employers and your colleagues that you are a serious person who takes your family responsibilities to heart and therefore will be a more predictable, reliable employee. If you are a woman, do not put pictures of your family in your office space because then people will think you cannot keep your mind on your work. Now, this was a number of years ago, um, but those kinds of implicit biases are still at work. And so when we think about how does, it, how does a nation or a society make a judgment to create more gender equality and all the things that need to be done to support and enable women, then you also have to ask, how do the individuals or the couples similarly make those decisions? And that's, you know, that's an ongoing uh, discussion. Mm. So, so um, we're focusing now on, on women with, with children and, and, or families with children, but the, the, the female workers are affected. Um, you appear in the Netflix series Explained um, in an episode called Why Women Are Paid Less. Mm -hmm. uh, and it states that the gender gap really is between women with children and everybody else. How does one target this problem? I, I really recommend uh, the Netflix uh, series Explain. They take a, uh, an individual problem and they try to break it down. And uh, that was the one that they interviewed me for mm -hmm. on, on pay equality. And uh, it made the point uh, that um, historically, when men and women enter the workforce at the same level, same level of experience, same level of education, they are paid equally. But as they go up the uh, employment ladder, uh, very often uh, disparities begin to appear. Even while they're still single, still uh, unmarried, still without children, and there seems to be a, a kind of step ladder uh, approach where women are on uh, a ladder with shorter steps than men. And so the men are moving up even when there are similar evaluations of their work, uh, similar uh, workplace uh, assessments. But the big gap shows up when women have children. And uh, again, some of it is, um, expectations that might never be expressed um, along the lines of, well, you know, I just thought now that you had children that you couldn't take on that additional responsibility, so I never asked. Or now that you have children, um, I, I thought that I'd be doing you a favor by uh, not offering you more overtime or more uh, um, assignments. And this whole question about implicit bias is really an important one because so many people really do think they are being fair. They are, they are trying to evaluate situations within the context of a workforce and they're trying to understand, okay, 
um, who can I really get the most work out of? And I don't want to impose unfair uh, burdens on someone who has other responsibilities. But that assessment only goes one way, only goes toward uh, young mothers. It does not go toward young fathers. And so because of that, um, those disparities begin to uh, show up and then they continue. You know, finally the tech companies are um, looking at their, at their payrolls and some interesting things are being discovered. Um, the first who did that was Salesforce. Mark Benioff, the founder and uh, president and CEO of Salesforce, was, you know, he, he wanted to challenge himself um, as to whether or not, with all this talk of pay inequality, uh, his company um, was guilty of that. So he had his uh, HR department, his payroll people run you know, analyses, and they found out, yes, indeed, that's exactly what happened. Enter at the same, first two, first step to maybe two, three steps, staying the same, and then even um, uh, before marriage, before uh, children, beginning to see the disparities and then uh, having those grow. So he ordered that, you know, the disparities be eliminated and that people in the, at the same level with the same experience, the same kind of evaluations be given uh, the same pay. Um, and and I, I haven't had a chance to read the study, but I saw the recent news about Google signing out that they were underpaying some men. Um, so, you know, we, we, we are living at a time when transparency uh, is uh, really the name of the game. You, you need to know, if you, if you work for a government, usually uh, pay levels are public information. And so if you're at a certain uh, grade of employment, a certain uh, level of responsibility, you know what the salaries are, and a lot of people choose government work, and at least they did in the past, in part because they felt like there would be uh, common uh, economic rewards. In the private sector, not so much. We don't have that kind of information for the vast majority of companies anywhere in the world. Um, but I do think it would be uh, a great service to the companies as well as to their employees if they began to do the same kind of analysis that Salesforce did. Mm -hmm. The um when we talk about staying at home with kids and even staying at home um, after the maternity leave is over, um, it's, it's also obviously a legitimate choice to, to stay at home. And, and one has to talk about this still like uh, without um, diminishing the value of care. Um, but how, how does one make it easier for women to, to re-enter the workforce um, after paternity leave and not feel like it's a maternity penalty? Well, I, I think that, first of all, your point is really important. Um, you know, the caregiving uh, that we do during our lives, uh, whether it be for children or for uh, a, uh, a sick, ailing, uh, ill um, spouse or for parents or other older relatives, you know, is a lot of what makes life special and makes life worth living. Um, so you don't want to have such a transactional view of human development and of opportunities in one's life that you diminish or, or penalize uh, the value of caregiving. But if at the same time you're looking at the economy, how do you try to manage both? And how do you give credit to the caregivers? You know, one of the big problems we've got in our, what we call social security, the retirement income after the age of 65, is that if you have been a full-time mother, or if you were in the workforce and you dropped out because you had a sick child or a sick spouse or a sick parent and you've been caring for that, the value of your care is significant. Hundreds of thousands of dollars that you would have to either pay for or the government would have to help pay for in the marketplace, you get no credit for that. So if you do get back into the workforce, you usually get back in at a level that it is far below where you would have been had you not dropped out of the workforce in the first place. And so you get no credit and you get penalized at the same time. There has to be a better way to think about this and to enact um, social programs that not only give paid leave to um, caregiving parents, 
uh, and caregivers of other loved ones, uh, family members and the like, but that gives some financial credit in terms of re-entry into the workforce or in terms of credit toward pensions and social security and the like. Uh, this, I think, will become an increasingly uh, important public issue because it's so unfair the way it is uh, currently uh, set up. And one of the other problems is that suppose you started off uh, in your 20s working in your field, whatever it was, in business, in the professions, um, and you did, uh, you, you went on maternity leave and you didn't go back for uh, a couple of years, uh, maybe you had another child at that time, so you were really focused on getting your children off to a good start. And then you thought your children are in school, you know, they're, they're doing fine, you want to get back into the workforce. Unless you're very lucky, um, you will get no credit, no respect for the time that you spent doing what arguably is the most important work anyone can do, um, preparing the next generation. So you go back into the workforce and you will be uh, behind the colleagues you started with, understandably, they didn't leave, you did, um, but there has to be some better approach than sidelining that talent. And a lot of women who uh, I've known uh, who found themselves in that position um, you know, started their own businesses. They became entrepreneurial. They didn't go back into an established uh, company uh, where they would be slotted below uh, where they thought they deserved to be. And that's one of the good news stories about this, because in the United States, um, women-owned businesses are the fastest growing uh, number of businesses. Now, a lot of them don't necessarily succeed right away. That's hard work. But women are being confident enough to start their own enterprises, which is one way of trying to get back into the workforce without the penalty. You know, it requires an enormous amount of confidence and hard work, but you're your own boss and you're not um, being, um, you know, discredited uh, in your own eyes for the time that you took off. Mm. Um, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the leg legislative uh, measures um, and, and ask uh, you, uh, uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, about how you look upon uh, that area. And, and th this is one of the differences, obviously, between uh, the Nordic uh, countries and, and America. And um, I'd like to just um, um, uh, mention a few examples. We've talked earlier today about uh, quotas, and, and we've heard from, from uh, scientists here at the uh, um, here at the school uh, about how it's a good idea, uh, but it needs it needs to be a part of a whole. Um, uh, but it is it is a way of, of speeding up progress. Um, and we have because we have a, a gender balance uh, law that that says that 40% um, um, that demands 40% females in company boards. And uh, it also we also have paternity leave, which is uh, more or less a use it or lose it paternity leave. It's being discussed in Parliament uh, these days. Um, still very uh, controversial uh, in many in many areas in Norwegian politi politics. And then and Iceland, I also like to mention because it was the first um, country to pass a law last year um, that ensures equal pay for equal work regardless of gender. Um, what do you think about uh, of these legis legislative um, measures? Well, I, I think, um, you know, and I really admire uh, the Nordic countries' history of trying to um, really establish uh, benchmarks for gender equality and pass laws that encourage people and require people to take uh, actions to move toward uh, gender equality. Um, look, I think equal pay should be the most obvious uh, requirement. and. Uh, we, we have a, a requirement for equal pay in the United States, but oftentimes it doesn't apply or it is not um, uh, understood by employees and they don't demand it or they don't actually even sue to uh, uh, guarantee their rights. We have a famous case uh, named for a woman named uh, Lily Ledbetter who was uh, the first uh, supervisor uh, that they call a foreman, um, on the floor of a big factory in Alabama. And, and I think there were six or seven male counterparts. 
And she did not know for years that she was paid less for doing exactly the same job as her uh, male counterparts. And it was, again, one of these old-fashioned assessments. Well, you know, she had a husband at home, and he was bringing in money, so, you know, that she didn't need to make as much as men who were supporting their families. But as she rightly pointed out, uh, she finally, when she finally found out about it, she sued about it, but complicated uh, case. She was too late, and she didn't get... Uh, he, she didn't get uh, her own uh, lawsuit's benefit, although then the law was changed, and um, actually President Obama signed the law uh, into action. I mention that because you can have equal pay on the books, but if people don't have transparency, they don't know whether they're being paid equally. She didn't know that every other male, you know, four man was being paid more than she. So you need transparency to go along with um, uh, e equal pay uh, laws. Then you've got the problem of different job categories. Um, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of discussion is going on uh, around uh, the, what we call paycheck fairness. So if you are uh, in a, um, a police department or you are in uh, a security department of a corporation, um, is the job sitting at the desk watching the cameras equivalent to the job of walking around the perimeter carrying a gun? You know, those are hard questions. You know, they're, they're security officers. They were both hired in at the same time. The woman sits at the desk watching the cameras uh, to be able to alert the guy with the gun on the perimeter, but the guy with the gun, you know, is walking uh, around. And it's those questions, so once you get, okay, once you get beyond same job uh, at the same time in the same place, then you get into a, a murkier area that people are trying to sort out uh, now. The question of quotas has never been uh, really addressed in our country. I think uh, the Nordic countries and I believe now Germany and a few other uh, European countries have, uh, either required or strongly suggested um, increasing the number of women on corporate boards. Uh, and you know, I think that something like that, uh, whether it's an incentive or a disincentive, makes sense because one of the most common refrains we still hear uh, in the United States when people are, say, when people are asked, uh, why don't you have any women on your board is, well, I just can't find any. Well, that is just ridiculous. Um, there are so many qualified women, and in fact, there are whole search firms with lists of qualified women. Um, so people are not looking very hard. And <laughs> if you don't send that signal from the top, you don't uh, really begin the cultural change down through the organization. And you know, I, I doubt that uh, you know we will we will have uh, such legislation passed in our own country, uh, but individual companies should be under pressure and should be uh, you know held to account if they have no women on on their board. Um, so I, I think there are steps that can be taken, and at this point, partly because of the Nordic countries' example, there should be enough data that people can say, okay, did it make a difference? I mean, did did the, uh, the quality of employment, did the um, goods and services provided, did the bottom line, wh you know, whatever the criteria might be to determine, did this make a difference that we had women on the board? The evidence I know suggests that it does, that diverse groups make better decisions. So it's not just diversity of gender, it's just diversity across all categories, so that you have people in decision-making roles who can contribute to uh, the discussion. And there was a recent study, and again, I, I, you know, I don't know anything other than what they reported, but that um, companies with women CEOs at least recently were doing better, that they were actually more profitable. And so th we need to look at the data, and we need then to apply the lessons from it, and we need to think of ways to incentivize more and more companies to be willing to take that on board and make some changes. Mm. 
Thank you. And that, that's obviously something uh, that we have a lot of room for development uh, here in Norway as well. We discussed it earlier um, uh, today. and. Uh, uh, because there's such a, a difference between uh, the public sector and the private sector. And uh, while we have e even the, the um, uh, center-right government that we have uh, these days, we have four party leaders uh, are women, prime minister, uh, the foreign minister, the finance minister are women. And uh, so 41% of, of, uh, of, of politicians in Norway are women. However, only 13% of business leaders are women. This is a business school. Um, so uh, there's some work to do here, uh, guys and girls. Um, why, why, is this, why is that even in the Nordic countries? Um, there's such a, a difference between, between those two sectors in society. Well, I didn't, I didn't know the statistics until you just mentioned them. Mm -hmm. does not surprise me. Um, the, um, the, I think the public is ahead of the private sector. Uh, and it's taken a long time to get there, but you're on your second woman prime minister. Uh, and uh, the uh, Norwegian government, as you said, uh, has a, uh, uh, a, a number of women in high major posts. I met with your foreign minister uh, earlier today, and I'm very grateful to the Norwegian government. They support the, the climate work of the Clinton Foundation and have for a number of years. Um, so there is a, um, an awareness, I think, on the part of the public that has been uh, building over uh, years, that if uh, given uh, women candidates and you evaluate them, you, you feel like you're um, free to make the decision that would put them into power at that 40% number. But I think a lot of private um, sector enterprises are still having very closed conversations where people of similar backgrounds and experiences, predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly male, socialize with one another, work with one another, talk and listen to each other. And it's a kind of closed loop. And it's not just a question of opening up that loop and getting uh, different points of view uh, that will matter to business. I think that, uh, I don't mean to be dramatic about this, but I, I think that there are lots of young people raising questions about capitalism. You know, is this, uh, is this, is this the method we want? Do we want, you know, free markets? Um, well, we do, maybe, if they're appropriately reflective uh, of the public good, of uh, common uh, effort, of uh, positive results. Well, how do we put all that together? And I think that uh, it, it's not just the right thing to do. I think it's essential for businesses to pay more attention uh, to these social uh, questions because uh, there's going to, there, there is, in many places right now, a bit of a backlash, isn't there? Uh, and there's a, unfortunately, uh, you know, building concern about uh, whether uh, we can produce the kinds of economic growth, the inclusive, uh, inclusive prosperity that uh, we are looking for in countries like Norway and certainly the United States, um, if the model is uh, not more open and that people are not more willing to, you know, not just look at the bottom line with the quarterly results, but are willing to start saying there's more than uh, one stakeholder. It's not only shareholders, it's employees, it's customers, it's communities, something that was much more common 50 years ago before there was a concerted effort on the part of uh, economists and theoreticians and business leaders to really narrow the focus. So this is not just about gender equality. Um, we see some of the same challenges on democracy. You know, if you don't have a government that looks like your society, that you, know, you cannot be what you cannot see, um, then you begin to uh, maybe distrust it or maybe reject it because you don't see your voice, your personhood uh, represented. So I think there are crises uh, affecting both uh, government and uh, business and the market uh, that can be dealt with in part by being more transparent, by being more open, by being more representative, and you know, including women, opening up those circles of opportunity is part of the way to answer that. Mm. Um, I'd like to turn uh, to, to rhetoric. Um, uh, we live in a, in a social media 
driven age uh, with um, uh, uh, public debate driven often by, by sound bites and um, uh, politicians such as, as yourself, Secretary Clinton, are often uh, judged as not being snappy enough. Uh, your message doesn't fit well on hats. <laughs> the, um, but 25 years ago, um, uh, at the uh, fourth annual uh, UN um, uh, World Conference on Women in Beijing, you uh, used a phrase that still sticks today. Um, to you and, and, and to the women's movement. Uh, so um, you said that um, um, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. Now, 25 years later, what is the status uh, of this? Well, you are certainly right about uh, snappy slogans that fit on hats. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you know, appeal to nostalgia and all other kinds of things. We won't go into that. Um, so, <laughs> I, I think we might get into that later. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think um, what I said in 1995 um, struck a chord uh, because it it cut through a lot of the debate about quote women's issues. We were being sidelined categorized, kind of put in a box. Like, you know, there were human rights sort of over here, and then there were women's rights somewhere over there. And it was one of the many ways that women's rights were marginalized and women's lives were ignored. I, before I, I gave that um, speech in 95, I had gone to um, South Asia um, and gone to India and Pakistan and Nepal and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and visited a lot of um, uh, programs for women, microcredit programs and the like. And uh, I was so struck by the resilience and the strength of uh, these market women, uh, these farmer women, women who uh, were often struggling against extraordinary odds that had been culturally and religiously imposed upon them, um, and how their lives were not recognized uh, as uh, being human rights struggles. Um, and so when, you know, when I was um, invited to go to Beijing, and it was quite controversial at the time, uh, even in my own country, uh, you know, I, I wanted to try to uh, explain the lives of women in as as brief and impactful a way. Uh, and I had I had met a young woman in India, a high school student, who gave me a poem about silence and about how women, and she talked about her grandmother in particular, led silent lives. Their voices were not heard. Their stories were not told their lives were not respected. And so at the, you know, at the conference that did uh, hit a chord and it became a, a kind of rallying cry, but what also happened at the conference, which do doesn't get enough attention, is that the vast majority of countries represented there signed on to a platform for action in which they talked about issues that were holding women back. Women couldn't inherit property. Women couldn't vote. Women couldn't drive cars. Women couldn't uh, go to secondary education. Uh, women were subjected to horrific domestic uh, violence. You know, the list went on and on. And so over the last 25 plus years, part of the agenda for the international women's movement is to remove those obstacles, to liberate women to be able to participate fully in society. I remember getting back from that conference and I did an interview, an international interview about it, and people were calling in from all over the world. And uh, one of the callers was a man from Iran. And he asked me, he said, well, what do you mean by women's rights? What do women want? What rights do they want? And I said, well, I want you to shut your eyes and think about all the rights you have, because that's what women want, the same that you have. And so we've made progress. I would be the first to say that. But you know, there are still something like 200 million girls who are not in school right now. Uh, there are more than 100 million who are subjected to female genital mutilation. There are many millions who don't get beyond primary education. 
their role in the formal economy is uh, still limited. I, I, I one time was in Africa uh, with a group of experts, so to speak, and everywhere I looked, I saw women. I saw women working in the fields. I saw women in the marketplace. I saw women carrying firewood. I saw women, women carrying babies. And you know, I said to one of the economists with us, you know, these women are working from sun up to sundown and beyond, and yet they don't earn very much money, if any at all, and their work is not considered important. And he said, well, we don't know how to measure the informal economy. So even the work that women did, and women are the majority of smallholder farmers in the world. You go on and on, and you see how, if there is, for example, agricultural programs in sub-Saharan Africa, um, the better seeds, uh, the better uh, anti-erosion programs, uh, the better uh, advice about how to get your uh, products to market, go to the male farmers, even though the vast majority of people tilling the soil are women. So we've made progress, but we have not by any means overcome uh, the uh, difficulty that uh, so many women around the world um, still face in, you know, in not only taking care of themselves, but being primarily responsible for taking care of their uh, families, often extended families. So I, I think that um, the, the level of effort has to be seen as uh, necessary at, at all levels. So, you know, getting those women the right to inheritance under their laws, getting those women access to those seeds for drought condition is just as important as getting more women into the C-suite. You have to work from both ends at the same time. Mm. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, um, the women's movement in America in particular as well, because um, Secretary Clinton, uh, uh, in the um, uh, uh, midterm elections, uh, things changed in America. The, um, um, we now, uh, you now have went from 20 to 23 percent women uh, representation in Congress. Um, and um, and actually, uh, not much reported upon, uh, the um, Congress got 10 years younger. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, um, and it had been steady declining or becoming older uh, for a while. Um, you talked a little bit about you know how, how history tends to do that, um, uh, two steps f f uh, ahead and maybe one back. But now we went maybe at least two steps ahead mm -hmm. in, in America. And, and how is how is that? Um, how is that changing American politics? And, and do you think also it's it's a bit of a stress test? Um, it's a type of a check and checks and balance to to, to the political development uh, from the administration. Well, I I think um, we we elected some terrific, as you say, young, vibrant, dynamic um, members of Congress. Um, and it was, uh, in many uh, instances, a reaction to what had happened uh, in 2016. Uh, the numbers of uh, uh, voters in what we call a midterm election surged, the highest that it's been in, I don't know, 70, 80, maybe longer years. Um, so there, there was a, both a positive energy uh, that really was generated by the candidates themselves, that they, uh, were exciting, they were diverse, they uh, worked really hard, and they won, uh, they won over voters. And the uh, energy, the negative energy of you know, making a statement against the administration and uh, the Republican Congress. So we really did make progress, but it's, it's a challenging political environment, to say the least. Uh, and there's a lot going on uh, that I, I think will, in the end, prove to be uh, beneficial uh, toward you know, both more women and more young people uh, in uh, politics, but also um, to reversing course away from a lot of the negative decisions that are being made by this administration on the environment, on uh, you know, every issue you can imagine uh, where the clock is being turned back. Um, but it's by no means a sure thing. Uh, you know, it, it is, you mentioned social media earlier, it is increasingly difficult 
to convey uh, a fact-based position, to rely on evidence um, in, in an environment where there are so many voices, and some of them, as we now know, manipulated voices, uh, voices, you know, bots and the like that are being controlled uh, from outside our own country. Uh, so how do we sort through that? I mean, if we're going to have a debate, which we definitely must have, it's something I've been working on, uh, as the introduction said, since 1993, about how we get, you know, quality, affordable, universal health care for everybody. How are we going to have a debate if you cannot get to any common understanding of the facts, the consequences of various actions that might be taken. Uh, and the, you know, the vitriol uh, that exists online um, from political, uh, different political positions is a, a force to be reckoned with. And it's very hard to keep up with it. It's hard to counter it. It's hard to overwhelm it. Um, and especially if uh, you have what we believe is a foreign adversary uh, doing a lot of the promoting of um, messaging uh, with a, a huge apparatus uh, at their disposal. This is a problem for every democracy, every political system. You can vote against me or anybody in politics you don't for any reason you want. But if you vote against someone because you are mis fundamentally misled, you are fed uh, a steady stream of untruths, uh, then you're being suckered. Because you're not making a rational decision. You are being manipulated. And propaganda has gotten much more sophisticated. And so I think uh, we've got new young voices who are already under attack. You know, some of these new members of Congress are already being uh, viciously attacked. And finally, we are calling out the Fox News Network for what it is, state propaganda, with a very, uh, very clear uh, set of goals to disrupt uh, the political system in favor of those who will do their bidding. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at least we're talking about some of the factors, but we're not yet at a position where we can uh, over, you know, overcome them uh, yet. And I think that's going to be a continuing uh, problem for any democracy in any election. How are voters ever going to sort out all of the barrage of information they are receiving in order to make even the best choice for their own interests? Um, you mentioned how, how the, the young and often female um, new Congress uh, people are, are um, attacked. And, and they also have a different way of, um, of um, going on the offense. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, was criticized for dancing, so she she'd kept on dancing. Yeah. Um, is, is that a new way of, of hitting back at, at these forces that you mentioned? Well, I, I think that you, you, if you're not active on social media um, in today's political environment, uh, you're missing uh, one of the most important uh, channels to uh, your constituents, to voters, to the general public. So I don't, I don't think there's a choice. Some people obviously are more uh, uh, able to use it for their benefit than others, but there's no choice. You have to be uh, engaged in that conversation. But if you are one voice against a thousand bots, it, as good as you might be, it may not be enough. I mean, I had people who campaigned for me in 2016 who would go door to door, knocking on doors with campaign literature, asking people to vote for me. People who were my strong supporters, some of whom um, had been my, my friends for decades. And, and someone would come to the door and they'd say, well, I can't vote for her, she kills people. Oh. Really? Who did she kill? Well, I saw it on the internet. Well, why would you believe it? Because it was on the internet. Where on the internet? Well, I saw it on Facebook. Oh, okay. I can't vote for her. She's dying. Where did you see that? I saw it on the internet. I saw it on Facebook. Facebook is the biggest news conveyor in the world. And they have done great damage Forget political candidates. They've done great damage. We are now facing 
you know, measles outbreaks in places in the United States and Europe because you have all of these anti-vaccination voices on Facebook who have, who know nothing, who have no um, responsibility for protecting children and communities, but they've had a big impact. And we've got a big measles outbreak right now in Oregon because all of these mothers who thought they were doing the right thing but were looking in the wrong place for information uh, refuse to vaccinate their children. So this is not just about politics, but we see it often most acutely uh, in a political setting. Mm. The way you... The way you were attacked, and I, and I think it's important to be, be concrete here, um, on the stage in the presidential debate, um, now President uh, Donald Trump called you a nasty woman. And while the uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we go high. Looking back, and, and, and I know you reflect upon this in your book, um, could you have tackled that, question, uh, um, that approach in a different way um, if you had stopped in your tracks, you were trying to, to uh, come across with a policy point, um, and, and turned to him and said, um, could you repeat that? Is, is that something you would um, appreciate somebody said to your wife, to your daughter? Is this the greatest uh, democracy on earth? Um, what would have happened if you did, had done that? Well, as, as you rightly point out, you know, in, in my book, um, What Happened, I, I uh, have a chapter about being a woman in politics. And uh, I don't take that example. I take the example of him stalking me uh, on the stage in the second debate. And, uh, it, you know, it, it's quite unnerving uh, to have someone uh, leering over you, um, you know, being uh, kind of constantly in your space. And I, my mind was worrying, whirling around trying to figure out, what do I do? You know, if I confront him about it, what are the chances people will, instead of seeing me standing up for myself, think that I can't handle it? Okay, or maybe think if I turn around and say, "What, what are you doing? You know, what, 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 what is this about?" That no matter how measured I try to be, it will come across as defensive and angry. I mean, all of this, and I'm trying to keep my attention on what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, they said I won the debate, but look, I think that he sent a lot of uh, messages, sort of alpha male messages. Uh, to his supporters, and it was very difficult in the moment. Now, because I've talked about this and written about it, and we have uh, women running for president, if one of them ends up as the nominee and finds herself in a similar situation, she will, I mean, it will not be unusual for her to respond because my story has given, you know, permission for that to happen. Um, but it, it is still difficult. Uh, you know, there's a quite large percentage of the Republican Party that say they would never vote for a woman for president. Uh, and there are still doubts even in the Democratic Party, not about any individual woman, so much as just can I envision a woman as the president of the United States? And so trying to create the level of confidence in your abilities, in your uh, potential to be commander in chief, uh, is a really hard line to walk for a woman. Uh, because, you know, even though it's quite amusing to me, we see all these men blowing up all the time uh, in public, um, and yet, you know, is she too emotional? Is she this? Is she that? So it is, in our political system, I've always said that it's easier for a woman to become a prime minister than a president. If you are in politics in Norway or the UK or Germany, um, you get elected in your constituency where people can know you personally, where they're not going to be misled by all the rumors and the nonsense stories that uh, are put out. I mean, they saw you at the grocery store. They saw you on the street. Um, and then your colleagues can get to know you and can appreciate your skills and your leadership. Um, so you can actually be chosen by your colleagues as the head of your party and then your uh, chosen as prime minister. 
In a presidential system, and particularly in our system, it is uh, like running the gauntlet. You have to raise, in my case, or anybody who gets a nomination, you have to raise more than a billion dollars. Uh, you have to put together a huge startup organization from a dead stop and get it up and running so that it can you know, carry you across the finish line. And you have to contend with all of these caricatures and stereotypes and expectations uh, if you're a woman running that um, you know, men don't because there can be a, you know, you, you can look at a, a stage full of men, they're different heights, they're different behaviors, they have you know, different uh, attitudes, but that all fits into a large definition of a potential leader. Now I'm hoping with more women running, it can possibly expand uh, the definition for women. But it is, it is still very difficult to figure out the right approach to coming across to you know, 330 million people um, as someone who can handle the job, who is uh, a, a pair of trusted hands uh, without making a misstep from you know, time to time. Mm. And um, could I ask you, uh, um, Secretary uh, Clinton, you also, um, you talked about um, how, how uh, foreign powers uh, try to influence elections and, and, and uh, disinformation, propaganda, and so on. Um, a lot of people are waiting for a re report these days, the Mueller report, uh, which uh, most probably will, will outline what has happened and it's, it's, it's a start of, start of the, the process will continue we know it won't uh, answer all the questions um, uh, but I, I, I'd like to just um, take you back to when you were a young lawyer um, um, helping investigate Watergate um, uh, and and um, preparing an impeachment uh, charges against uh, President uh, uh, Nixon and and, and um, we know that he welcomed uh, the report uh, saying that, uh, uh, or welcomed the investigation saying that the, the American people have a right to know if their president is a crook or not. But we also know that um, um, uh, privately that was not his opinion at all. Uh, he was very upset about it. And, and the current president is, is not only privately, but publicly very upset about this. He's tweeted uh, uh, every other day, according to New York Times, he's, he's tweeted about this. Um, and. Um, uh, but in July 1974, after a long battle, um, the Supreme Court, uh, through uh, your work and others, ordered uh, Nixon to surrender uh, the secretly recorded um, White House conversations that, that highlighted this. What can we expect and what, can, what do you expect, what do you hope for uh, when the Mueller report comes? Well, I, I, I think there's already a lot of information in the public domain for people who are interested uh, in following this. There have been two major indictments by uh, Mueller of Russian individuals and organizations. Uh, the first indictment uh, dealt with the interference on social media, uh, and it is quite a read if you know you can follow American legalese uh, to see the evidence that recites intercepted phone conversations, intercepted email messages um, about. Um, from Russian generals to their uh, subordinates about what they're supposed to be doing on social media. There's a memorable line which goes something like, um, uh, say anything negative about Hillary Clinton, but not Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. We support them. Um, and that's a direct quote. So if you read that, you can see the very intense effort that the Russians were engaged in to influence public opinion, to sow discord and divisiveness on social media. The second indictment goes to the hacking, um, the theft of materials. Remember, Richard Nixon was brought down largely because of a physical burglary. He had agents breaking into the Democratic National Committee to steal information. This is the equivalent of that only through cyber means. So the Russians stole DNC information, stole information uh, from my campaign, uh, my campaign manager, and then they weaponized that information. Um, and they were aided and abetted in some way that perhaps we will uh, learn more about when Mueller uh, issues uh, a final report or more indictments. There's an 
uh, a very well-known, respected academic by the name of Kathleen Hall Jameson. And for years, her specialty has been studying elections. And she had retired, and people came and said, you know, you've got to look at this. You've got all this data and this backlog of information and experience. So she did. And her conclusion, after looking at everything that's already in the public domain, was that the social media attack by the Russians certainly influenced opinion. The theft of the information and the release of it and the weaponization of it affected the outcome. So that's one expert who's, who's looking hard and analyzing what's already out there. So we don't know whether what um, Mueller has will rise to the level uh, that is necessary for a criminal indictment. Um, but there is a lot of, there's a lot of uh, dots to be connected. Let me just say one other thing about that, which is um, I, I did serve on the, uh, uh, what was the House Judiciary Committee Impeachment Inquiry staff in 1974. And our job uh, was to gather evidence. And we were meticulous about this. We were led by lawyers who were as nonpartisan and independent as you could be. They were Republicans and Democrats, but that was irrelevant. They were accomplished lawyers of integrity. And they were adamant that you know no opinion would come into our analysis. It would all be and only be facts. And because of that work, when the evidence was presented to the Judiciary Committee, the vote to impeach President Nixon in that committee was bipartisan. Three Republicans joined all of the Democrats. And I don't know whether that would happen today. You know, I don't know whether we've gotten so far away from the rule of law and evidence uh, leading to whatever conclusions one should reach that we could expect any kind of bipartisan uh, cooperation. But that did happen in 74, and because that happened, that led to President Nixon resigning, because he could see that it was uh, stacked against him. The evidence was stacked against him. And I, I have a question um, uh, that, that deals with what you would have done differently, Secretary Clinton. Um, and we, we were talking about it earlier as well with that incident uh, on stage. Um, um, forgive me, but it's difficult to ask that question without saying, what would you have done differently if you had run again? OK. Uh, so, so this is, yes, this is the uh, disguised uh, are you running a question. Uh, did you pick up on that? <laughs> the, um, because um, you were quoted, uh, and, and this is only Tuesday. Uh, it was a, a fairly small uh, TV station, uh, upstate New York. Um, um, and, and you recorded saying, this was the most definitive uh, until now, um, saying that you would um, keep on, quote, keep on working and speaking and standing up for what you uh, believe, uh, but you were not running. Was that a bit too definitive um, as of now? And, 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 um, and, and the, um, it, do you see a situation where you, we talked about the Miller Report, uh, where you actually find yourself running? You know, no matter what I say, um, I'm going to be in trouble. Um, I, 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 I cannot imagine running. I just can't. And, and I've said it repeatedly and, and over and over again. Um, look, I, I am in the camp of people who believe it's imperative that our country elect a different president. I think that for... Um, For the sake, not only of the United States, but of the entire world. Um, and so you all have a stake in this. Uh, and I, I have no illusions about how hard that's going to be. Uh, the people who support him are still very uh, committed to their position. And mustering the uh, resources, the organization, uh, fighting against all of the propaganda, the active measures that are going to be used against uh, a Democratic nominee is not for the faint-hearted. It is incredibly hard. 
And, you know, when I look back at the campaign we ran, I mean, I had, you know, the, the best political operatives you could find, people who had been involved in President Obama's campaigns, either 08 and 12 or both, uh, people who had great track records of winning in difficult uh, races, in tough states. Uh, we, we really compiled a, a tremendous uh, talent uh, roster for our campaign. We obviously raised the money that was uh, needed, but um, we were running, as somebody recently wrote, we were running like Obama 2.0, and we did it very well. But Trump was running an entirely different kind of campaign, and he did it very well. And it was a campaign that a lot of it was uh, very much out front in public, the insults, uh, the crowds that just absolutely ate up every word he said, and the more insulting it was, the more they responded uh, with great cheers and chants and all the rest of it. But then there was the sort of under the radar campaign. You know, there was a recent academic study um, which looked at people who had voted for Obama in 2012 and then voted for Trump in 2016. It was done by Ohio State University. and. They asked this cohort of voters who they identified, well, what changed your mind? And predominantly, it were these lies about me. So I was dying was one of the big ones. I was somehow responsible for weapons for ISIS. Go figure. Um, <laughs> and that Pope Francis had endorsed Trump. And when these people were at, where did you see this? Same answer, on the internet. But not just, you know, a friend sharing this information, but really well-produced, phony news broadcasts. You know, from a studio in Macedonia or Ukraine, primarily, there would be a very American-looking and talking guy, maybe an American, um, in a studio and, oh, you know, Pope Francis endorsed Donald Trump today. And then there would be uh, messages sent to targeted people's uh, social media uh, feeds. And we had no idea all this was happening. I mean, you know, occasionally it would break through into the mainstream press and it was ludicrous on the face. Pope Francis didn't endorse Trump. They got into a Twitter war <laughs> when Pope Francis went to our border and Trump insulted the Pope. And the Pope defended refugees, as a Pope should, right? <laughs> and yet, it didn't matter because people were getting the information that they valued and trusted the most. So I believe that in the next election, whatever they were able to do in 2016, they will do even better and more of now. And if you're running, as all of our candidates are, and we have, as you know, many running, they're not able to build the infrastructure that the Russians already have, or that the Trump campaign has been adding to ever since the 2016 election, or that Fox News is propagating uh, the stories. So it will, be, it will be a challenge. Now, there's no doubt the majority of voters and public opinion and energy is on our side. But I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure the Democrat wins, whoever the Democrat is. Um, I think we only have time for one last question. Um, you, you, um, you mentioned that there is a, a vast field of Democratic uh, candidates. Uh, five of them are, are women, um, um, and it's only getting started. The, um, so last question, if we put it, and you also have throughout uh, um, your remarks, and, and thank you so much, uh, analyzed American society, um, um, and also pointed to a lot of challenges that remain, and, and your thoughts upon that. So let me, let me put it this way. If you were to run, who would be a good pick for vice president? You, you are very persistent. Um, 
<laughs> Look, I, I'm not going to comment on the field. I know everybody who's running, they, they all um, have strengths and weaknesses, like every person and every political candidate. And as you also point out, the field is not yet set. There are likely to be a couple more uh, significant announcements within uh, the next month, uh, at least uh, I think so right now. Um, so the field will probably not be complete until m maybe by the first debate, which is in June. Um, and then you'll, then you'll see who has staying power, who can raise the money. I mean, it's really almost kind of sad that our system depends so much on raising so much money and the campaigns are so long. Um, but that is what we currently uh, have. And, and so then we'll begin to see like who's gonna catch fire, who's gonna be um, you know, able to stand on that debate stage and distinguish him or herself. So we, we don't know yet. Um, but uh, it, is, uh, you know, it, it is exciting to have both so many candidates running and so many women running. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, the Democrats are looking for whoever is the strongest candidate uh, to put up against Trump and who can withstand what is uh, a, uh, a tremendously toxic, negative campaign uh, coming from the other side and emerge victorious. And that's all we care about right now. We got to win. That's important. Thank you. I'm sorry I had my back to you. I apologize. Thank you very much, Eric. That was great. Thank you so much as well, uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, for your remarks and, uh, and, and talking so um, uh, candidly and openly to our students and faculty members. And thank you for being here uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.